Jonathan, if you're back with us, I, nobody was uh, talking, so that's why. <laughs> so that's the good news. <laughs> if you couldn't hear anything. Uh, uh, Jonathan, can you start your uh, video so we can see you? I do not have video capability. Okay, no worries about that. But at least you can hear me, and uh, so you will be able to hear all the meeting. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Perfect. That that works. Okay, so I know that we are missing uh, some members, and Sandra had some issues. Uh, but I will be okay. Give me just a second. I'm just checking with my colleagues. We'll be able to start a meeting in a minute. Yes. Okay, so I will ask the members. Uh, well, first of all, good morning to you all. I admitted you one by one, and I'm glad that you could make it. So I will ask you if you can, for those who can, uh, put their camera. All the non members, you can put it off so I will uh, take a picture of all the group so it's will it will be a virtual picture <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us today really okay so we have you are we still missing some uh, Isabel Michael I hear Yes, can you, uh, Isabel, eh, puede poner su video? Así ah, es perfecto. Sí. Así puedo sacar una foto de todos. Voy a parar la mía. <laughs> <laughs> we'll still need Michael. Oh, right now? No, I can see him. Not in the waiting room. Oh, because you have to write. Uh, sorry yes we we are still waiting on some members because i believe that someone had a they say they are on the waiting room but they are not in the waiting waiting room so i believe they have the a wrong uh um uh link to connect so let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yes it's that that thing they happen sometimes okay so at least we'll the one that are that are here, I can take a picture, and then if they join us later, so oh, I will stop my. We don't we don't need to see me. <laughs> okay, so uh, in one, two, three, we say cheese. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I will double check to see if it, it if it worked uh, up. Thank you for that. And then I will let uh, Haiti speaking up. Uh, let me double check where I can have this. Okay. I will, oop, right. let me see. Thank you so much, Caroline. You're welcome. Thank you for all your hard work and for doing all the tech checks for our advisory group members. And thank you folks for coming in, um, for joining us this morning. As a reminder, uh, for those who would like to uh, who would like the Spanish interpretation, please select the Spanish channel and mute original audio by clicking on the interpretation feature with the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. If you need any technical assistance or language interpretation assistance, please email us at safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Next slide.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Haiti Anamina with the Office of Public Participation. I would like to thank each of you for joining us today for the Advice, Safer Advisory Group meeting. We have a lot to cover today, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Last time we met in person, um, we met in person to adhere to the Bagley King Act with SB 189 signed into law after our meeting in June. It now allows, us, uh, allows advisory group members to participate in advisory group meetings virtually or in person until July, 2023. Thank you for responding to our email regarding virtual participation for this meeting. The majority of you prefer to join virtually and we'll do the same for the last meeting of the year scheduled for December 1. We will provide more information about the Safer Advisory Group meeting number four, which is the last one, as soon as it becomes available. For new members that will be joining next year, we will be surveying their preference for joining the first meeting of 2023. Next slide. This meeting is being webcast publicly in both English and Spanish at video.calepa.ca.gov. We are recording today's meeting and we'll post it on our website for anyone who may not be able to join us today. For those of you watching the webcast of this meeting, you, can, you have the option to watch the webcast in English or Spanish at video.calepa.gov. For members of the public, if you would like to speak and provide your comment, please email safer at waterboards.ca.gov and we'll add you to the public comment list. If you get disconnected at any time during the meeting, we ask that you rejoin the meeting. For technical or language interpretation assistance, email us at safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Next slide. The mission of the water boards is to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of present and future generations. We want to begin this meeting by acknowledging the groups who have experienced economic, environmental, and social disadvantages as a result of historical marginalization, racism, and injustices. The safe and affordable funding for equity and resilience drinking water program was created to bring environmental justice to California. As a reminder, our work today should strengthen the empowerment of indigenous and community voices as we work together to provide safe and affordable water to all Californians. Next slide. I want to begin our meeting with the purpose of the Safer Advisory Group. The advisory group is a, is a consultative body that advises the state water board on the development of the fund expenditure plan and other aspects of the Safer program. The advisory group is not authorized to approve documents, make policy decisions, or evaluate individual applications for funding. In our discussions today, we do not have to come to consensus or agreement. We value and welcome your perspectives. Water board staff will capture your feedback. We will share your feedback with our board and, and to take it into consideration during their decision making. We will send out meeting notes to advisory group members within three weeks for your review. Some of the guidelines for today's meeting, please mute yourself when not speaking, join by video if possible, and remember to have an appropriate background as we are being live streamed. Take breaks as you need them, select the proper language interpretation channel by clicking on the interpretation feature with a globe icon in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. We have, an oral, we have two oral um, interpreters providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. Please remember to speak slowly to, remember, to ensure that interpreters can capture all of your feedback. If, if a presenter or advisory group member is speaking too fast, we will ask you to slow down so that the interpreters are able to accurately capture your question or comment. 
during the question and answer portions of the meeting, please use the raise hand feature if you have a question or comment. When asking a question or making a comment, we ask that you keep it short to the point to allow other members to participate. Please have your meeting materials packet. We will be referring to the materials throughout the course of the day. Also, there will be a closed session for the advisory group members after we close the meeting. Please make sure to stay logged on to Zoom. Next slide. So let's jump into today's agenda. We have a lot to cover. <laughs> we'll be discussing the draft fund expenditure plan and get your feedback on how you think the board should prioritize funding and allocate funding. We'll learn about strategy for domestic wells and state smalls, and we'll get your feedback on approaches for domestic wells and state smalls. Then we'll discuss the point of use and point of entry white paper, and you'll have an opportunity to provide feedback on the pilot studies and outreach efforts. We'll share some safer program updates related to the state auditor's office report and offer an opportunity for you all to ask questions or other to other elements uh, to the safer program as well. Advisory group members will have an opportunity to make announcements or things you would like to share with the group relevant to the safe drinking water. We'll close out by hearing comments from members of the public. After the public comments, we'll have a closed session on conflict of interest training provided by, the, by our Office of Chief Counsel. The closed session will, be, will not be recorded and will not be open to the public. Before we jump into our warmer, I'd like to ask if there are any questions related to our guidelines or today's agenda. Okay, none. All right, next slide. With that, I'd like to hand off the mic to Marina. Marina, you might be on mute. Oh, I, Is that I hear you now, perfect. I think my apologies, I think it was my headset. Let me start all over again. <laughs> Good morning, uh, my name is Marina Perez and I'm with the Office of Public Participation. Uh, you'll be hearing from me quite a bit today. Um, however, I wanted to take the time uh, to introduce myself and to get the group warmed up uh, with the round of 20 second introductions. So when I call your name, uh, please turn on your microphone, uh, share your name, your affiliation, your physical location, and one thing that you plan to do before the summer ends. And I'll start, for example, uh, my name is Marina. I'm with the State Water Board's Office of Public Participation. I am based in Sacramento. And this summer, I'm planning to spend a weekend at the beach. So as you do your introductions, uh, uh, please, again, as a reminder, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself when you're speaking and remember to mute yourself when you are not. So, and also keep your introduction brief. So we're asking no more than 20 seconds. So I'm gonna call on folks to introduce themselves. And so uh, I'm gonna start off with, is Horacio, has Horacio made it in? If Horacio is present, if he can introduce himself. If not, we'll move on to uh, Jonathan Rash. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Rash. I'm with the uh, Indian Health Service based in Sacramento. And I definitely want to stay cool before the summer ends. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Next, we'll move on to Don James. Has Don, has Don joined us? Okay, if Don, okay, we'll, we'll move on to Cassie. Cassie, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Cassie Chahan. I'm with the North Kings Groundwater Sustainability Agency. I'm here in Fresno and my summer has ended. I have kids that play sports, so I'm just gonna be watching lots of sports between now and when school ends again. Thank you, Cassie. All right, uh, up next is Castillo. Hi, thank you. 
Uh, Castro Estrada with the Coachella Valley Water District Board of Directors. I also work for the city of Coachella. I'm here at my house in the city of Coachella. And like Cassie, I, I, I kind of feel like my summer ended already. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm kind of getting ready for Christmas, but that, that's it. Sweater weather. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Castillo. Okay, we're going to move on to Janmin. You want to provide your introductions? Hi, my name is Janmin. I'm with the local primary state agency in Yolo County, and I'm based in Woodland. And my summer also ended, and I'm ready for the cooler weather. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Janmin. Uh, Esther. Uh, buenos días, mi nombre es Esther Espinosa, yo soy de la comunidad de Riverdale, California, y soy miembro de esta mesa, y uh, lo último que quiero hacer antes de que termine el verano es este, uno o dos días nuevamente en la playa, porque es necesario, gracias. So I'm not sure if that, if that was translated. But it basically said that, um, you know, she was hoping also to um, uh, spend one, uh, one or two days in the beach as well. Okay. I did hear the translation, Marina, for okay. what it's worth. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Um, next up is Rami. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. This is Rami Kalon. I'm uh, with California Water Service. I'm based in San Francisco. Don't have any other plans for the summer, anxiously awaiting for this winter and hoping it rains. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rami. Okay. Uh, has Emily joined us yet? If Emily has not joined us, then we'll move on to uh, Mikey. Michael Rincon. Hi, everyone. Um, Michael Rincon. Uh, I am the uh, a research and policy manager at Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles. I am calling from my hometown in Thousand Oaks in Ooh. Ventura County. And uh, let's see, something to do before the summer ends. Um, I mean, the last real thing I have planned for the summer is that I'm going to Cancun for a friend's wedding. So uh, it's been completely chaotic leading up to it so i'm just really excited just to get it over with <laughs> i love my friend but it's, it's too much all right yeah. yeah thank you so much mikey mm -hmm. all right we'll move on to ethel ethel you want to provide your introduction hi i'm ethel and i'm in um i'm from um i'm working with lake francis mutual water company as a board member treasurer and vp and um, i am based in dobbins california and uh, my goal before summer ends is to uh, still continue on working on my um, home hardening due to this fire season. So it's a never ending job. I still have a little bit more projects to do. Thank you, Ethel. We'll move on to Sergio. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Sergio Carranza here with uh, Pueblo Unido CDC. Um, in the city of La Quinta. I hope that everything is safe uh, in the mountains because I would like to go to do some camping uh, before the, um, the summer ends. Great. That sounds fun. Thank you, Sergio. Move on to uh, Mr. Michael Prado Sr. Michael, uh, Mr. Prado, I think you may be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, my name is Michael Prado Sr. And I'm uh, a board member, also uh, president of the Sultana Community Services District. My location is uh, Central San Joaquin Valley, uh, Northern Tulare County, Sultana, California. And one thing I want to do before summer ends is eat all the fruit and fresh vegetables that I can eat before the season's over. What a great plan. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Sandra. Hello, I'm Sandra Chavez. 
I am representing domestic well owners in the area of Porterville, and I'm also calling from Porterville. Um, something I'm looking forward to for the summer, well, yeah, I feel like my summer is over now too, the semester, the fall semester already started, but I'm looking forward to cooler weather and also spending some time on the weekends with my family from here until maybe Christmas, Thanksgiving, when I have more of a break. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll move on to Isabel. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Isabel Solorio. Eh, estoy aquí desde la comunidad de Lener, el condado de Fresno. Eh, soy miembro del grupo uh, de agua, de asesor. Eh, una de las cosas que los planes que tendría para este verano es, pues es el clima, es demasiado caliente aquí en el valle, pero me fascina mi jardinería, o so disfrutar mis nuevas plantas eh, antes de que llegue el invierno y se mueran. Y también um, soy muy um, apetecible a las frutas, o so disfruta las frutas, las últimas frutas, porque vienen ya los granos que se cultivan en el valle. Gracias. Gracias. Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to uh, ask Maria Luisa. Buenos días a todos. Espero que todos estén pasando un bonito día hoy. Aunque sé que la señora se murió y todos están de lutos en el mundo, pero yo no. Uh, mi nombre es María Luisa Muñoz y yo soy miembro asesor desde el 2020 y estoy respaldada por Self Help Enterprises, quienes me llevaron a la junta hasta el Sacramento y me hubiese gustado verlos a todos personalmente. Y una de las, estoy en Baisele, California, y una de las cosas, cosas que planeo hacer para este verano es ir a disfrutar de la playa. Un lugar tan bonito que me encanta es Cambria. Y es lo que quiero ir. Quiero ir en este verano y disfrutar de la playa. Yo creo que todos los que estamos aquí empezamos en la playa, deberíamos ir juntos para allá. Gracias. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then for our last two, uh, we'll have Jim go next, followed by Jennifer. Did you say Jim Sullivan? Jim, Jim Sullivan, yeah. yes. Apologies. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Jim Sullivan, and I represent uh, domestic well owners. And um, I'm um, in the town of Mendocino, in Mendocino County. Um, sorry to say it's 65 degrees here today. Um, but uh, as far as the summer, um, probably some uh, painting of a garage. So that's not too exciting, but that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Jennifer, you want to uh, take us home now? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Hazard. I'm with the Rural Community Assistance Corporation, and uh, I have a field office in San Diego County. And the one thing I'd like to do before summer ends, I'm going to do it next week. I'm looking forward to going to Kansas City to visit my daughter and her husband. Thanks, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you. So did we capture everybody? I know there were some folks that were still missing. So if, if somebody didn't go, please let me let us know. I think I got everybody that um, has signed in and is, is with us right now. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds like the, those plans sound really amazing. And I'm really hoping that you're able to complete them in, in a safe manner. And hopefully we'll, we'll uh, get out of this heat wave pretty soon. So thank you all for sharing. Um, so with that being said, um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and um, introduce uh, our first speaker. I'm going to introduce Jeff uh, Wetzel from the division uh, a financial assistance who will provide um, present an overview of the draft fund expenditure plan. Uh, in preparation for this discussion, please turn to your materials packet, uh, pages th two to, to four. Um, so also once Jeff completes his presentation, uh, Jeff will be responding to any clarifying questions on the presentation. Uh, with that, I'll welcome uh, Jeff. Next slide. Thank you, Marina. Good morning. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Jeff Wetzel. I'm a senior engineer over the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Unit in the Division of Financial Assistance. Today, I'll be talking about the draft fiscal year 2022-23 fund expenditure plan, or FEP, 
for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, which was released for public comment on August 15th. Next slide, please. We'll start by looking back on progress made in fiscal year 2021-22. Next slide, please. This slide shows our key metrics for the safe and affordable funding for equity and resilience or safer program and our performance over the past fiscal year. We've provided interim solutions to 55 communities and about 1200 households. We provided technical assistance or TA projects for 94 communities, 27 of which were planning via technical assistance. We've executed or completed planning assistance projects for 10 communities and completed construction projects for 37 communities. These totals represent the broader SAFER program, which includes other funding sources aside from the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, which I'll mention in a bit. For the construction projects shown on the slide, the numbers in parentheses reflect projects which primarily benefit small disadvantaged communities or low-income households. In total, this adds up to over 720 million in funding, benefiting approximately 7.8 million people. For additional performance metrics um, are included in the FEP in section seven and appendix I. We also have a section that describes a number of process improvements that we are focusing on this coming fiscal year and some that we have already completed. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm not seeing the slides being advanced, but I can go, there you go, perfect. So this slide shows some of the other metrics for the SAFER program that we think is worthwhile to mention. During the last two fiscal years, 92 communities have been returned to compliance, meaning their water is safe to drink. Currently, there are 207 active consolidation projects. Three of those consolidation projects came from mandatory orders issued by the Division of Drinking Water. Two of them are already in construction and one is still pending. And there are 19 executed funding agreements for consolidation projects. Talking a little bit about administrators, the Division of Drinking Water has designated 14 new water systems as potentially needing to accept an administrator. One administrator order was issued and two funding agreements for administrators have been executed. Next slide, please. So taking a look at the safer program assistance by system type for systems outlook compliance or those on the human right to water list or HR2W, 220 of the 368 or 60% of the systems have either assistance approved or requested with total funding either approved or pending of 337 and a half million. For the human right to water systems not receiving assistance, there could be a couple of reasons for this. The system could be new to the list. The system has relatively low cost solutions that they are able to self fund without financial assistance from the state. Or the system has violations that are not project related, like failure to monitor and report. For the at risk systems, 128 out of 432, or 30% of the systems, have either assistance approved or requested, with a total funding either approved or pending of 226 and a half million. As we continue to enter into agreements with our newly qualified technical assistance providers and increase our TA capacity, the hope is also to increase the assistance to at-risk systems. Next slide, please. Looking at the projects we funded across the broader SAFER program, this table shows a breakdown of funding committed in fiscal year 2021-22 by type of project across the top and funding source down the left. These are the funding sources we refer to when we talk about the broader SAFER program. There's obviously the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, general obligation bonds, various general fund appropriations, 
and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund Principal Forgiveness. Overall, in fiscal year 2021-22, the State Water Board committed funding to about 100 drinking water projects, totaling about $290 million in assistance. The largest portion of that going towards planning construction projects via last year's general fund infrastructure appropriation. Next slide, please. So now looking at the safe and affordable drinking water fund specifically, this chart shows a breakdown of commitments to this last fiscal year by solution type. We had over 17 million towards interim water supply and emergencies. Notable investments included an amendment to the tanks and hauled water program in the Central Valley and a co-funding agreement with the Valley Water Collaborative, which represents two management zones to complement their work implemented under CV Salts. Additionally, we reserve over 47 million to continue to use towards interim water supply in emergencies related to drought, including development of additional countywide or regional programs for state smalls and domestic well communities. Note that the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund will only be used if no other drought funding is available. For technical assistance, two amendments to existing TA agreements were funded through the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to extend services through 2025. Funds were also committed to one new TA provider, the California Urban Water Agencies, which will allow larger water systems to partner with smaller water systems to provide enhanced assistance to address technical, managerial, and financial capacity deficiencies. For administrators, no safe and affordable drinking water funds were directed to support administrators this past fiscal year. However, 5.7 million was committed from the general fund last year to develop two new master agreements with qualified administrators. These master agreements will help streamline the provisions of funding for water systems as designated um, by the Division of Drinking Water to accept an administrator. For planning, with the large amount of funding available through the Budget Act of 2021 for drinking water infrastructure, no safe and affordable drinking water funding was committed this past fiscal year towards planning projects. However, 23 TA work plans were executed in this past fiscal year to conduct planning, which is 28% higher than in fiscal year 2020-21. And then per the proposed safer program priorities, it is expected that more planning projects will be directed to go through TA, especially as new TA provider master agreements are executed particularly those with engineering consulting firms. For construction, three construction projects were funded through the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund for systems outlook compliance, at risk, and other community water systems. This is an 82% decrease in the number of construction projects funded by this fund compared to fiscal year 2020-21. And that is due to the large amount of funding available through other funding sources for drinking water infrastructure. For direct O&M support, one direct O&M project was committed from the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to support the daily operations of the East Erosi Community Service District once an administrator is appointed. And a similar direct O&M support was committed for the Casadero Water Company via the general fund. We continue to reserve funds for the point of use, point of entry treatment pilot and some other contracts that we use. And then lastly, actual staff costs were close to what was initially estimated. Next slide, please. So this slide is similar, but shows the committed expenditures from fiscal year 2021-22 by system type. So the majority of the funding committed went to serve all system types via the new TA agreements and amendments. And a good portion of funding went towards interim solutions for communities and households served by state smalls and domestic wells. And then as noted previously, around 47 million is reserved for interim project services, such as bottled and hold water. Next slide, please. And now let's look ahead to the current fiscal year, 2022-23. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows all the funding sources we have available for the SAFER program to go towards drinking water projects. Note that these are funds available, not necessarily funds we will be able to commit during this fiscal year. Out of the 1.15 billion total available for grants for drinking water projects, only about 325 million, the light blue portion, is available for non-capital projects. The Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund continues to be our most virtual funding source available with the capabilities of funding interim water supply in emergencies, administrators for failing water systems, operation and maintenance, as well as projects and programs that benefit communities served by state smalls and domestic wells. Next slide, please. These are the proposed priorities shown in the draft FEP. They continue to focus our efforts on small disadvantaged communities and low-income households. These proposed priorities are largely unchanged from last year and should look familiar. One new priority to this year's FEP is highlighted by the STAR, which is provide direct operation and maintenance support to assist community water systems facing the highest affordability burdens while promoting sustainability and technical, managerial, and financial capacity building. Next slide, please. These are our proposed targets for the new fiscal year's appropriation of 130 million. Overall, we propose 111.3 million to go towards projects with 18.3 million for interim water supply in emergencies. And again, we will carry forward an amount about 47 million for these projects from the fiscal year 2021-22 appropriation. We'll target 72 million for technical assistance, 5 million for administrators, 3 million for planning, 3 million for direct O&M support, and 10 million for construction. Along the bottom there, we'll retain 3.2 million for the point of use point of entry treatment pilot, 1.5 million for contracts, such as data management investments, and then an estimated 14 million for staff costs, which coverage both administrative and implemented implementation personnel costs required by SB 200. Next slide, please. So to highlight a few items regarding the 2022-23 targets, solutions will continue to focus on small disadvantaged communities and low-income households, while also allowing for funding for small non-disadvantaged communities or medium disadvantaged projects, disadvantaged community projects that either address a high priority public health impact or are part of a consolidation effort. Significant investments are proposed to help address the large number of state smalls and domestic wells identified as being at high risk of groundwater contamination or at high risk of being impacted by the drought. Services will include interim water supplies, emergency funding, technical assistance, and construction. There will also be significant investments proposed for TA to develop and execute master TA agreements with the newly qualified drinking water TA providers Establishment of new TA agreements will increase the capacity statewide and help support accelerated planning efforts for systems outlook compliance and consolidations. Some funds will help establish additional administrator agreements, either as master agreements or system specific agreements. Some funds are also targeted to further develop the direct O&M funding program and establish a streamlined approach to distribute O&M funding based on certain affordability criteria that are still to be established. And then the applications for direct o &M support will also continue to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Targets for planning and construction projects are relatively low, given the large amount of funding still available from the general fund infrastructure appropriation. Safe and affordable drinking water fund may be suitable, however, for specific needs such as planning for regional scale consolidation efforts, consolidation incentive projects, or construction projects which incorporate significant greenhouse gas reduction elements. Next slide, please. 
So next, I want to summarize some key updates to the FEB text compared to last year's version. Next slide, please. For direct O&M support, more detail was added around the steps to develop the O&M funding program, including the affordability threshold, program guidelines, key conditions of funding, and streamlining the O&M funding award and disbursement process. In the construction section, a proposed list of project conditions was added where certain eligible construction projects, including consolidations, may be funded with safe and affordable drinking water funds via the urgent drinking water needs application process, rather than the traditional drinking water state revolving fund application and approval process. For PFAS, information was added on how a portion of state funding for PFAS will be utilized to meet the needs of small disadvantaged communities, for example, in support of statewide testing, implementation of treatment pilots, and planning for regional scale consolidation. Construction projects to address PFAS will be funded per the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund Intended Use Plan and Supplemental Intended Use Plan for Emerging Contaminants. Related to drought infrastructure, SB 552 requirements were added in for small water suppliers and counties, as well as potential funding opportunities via the State Water Board and the Department of Water Resources. And lastly, the metrics and performance section was expanded to track the safer program performance across the eight metric categories introduced in the safe and affordable drinking water fund policy plus one racial equity and environmental justice metric, which was added to last year's FEP. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, these are the next steps for the fund expenditure plan. The draft is posted and public comments period closes on September 14th. We'll respond to comments and revise the plan this month in September and we'll bring it back to the board for their consideration at the October 3rd special board meeting. Please note that we had originally planned to bring it to the board on November 1st, as you see here on the slide, but we have since moved that up to October 3rd. My Marino. Next slide, please. So that's it for my talking points. I can uh, stop here and open it up for questions on the material. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, wanna, we'll take this time now to, to take questions. And um, so I know that there was one question that was already submitted. So I just wanna let folks know that uh, we will be using the raise hand feature for that and we will be taking raised hands in the order that they were received. Uh, we did receive a question during your presentation uh, and that was uh, Michael Livingpon, um, followed by, I believe now it's, um, other questions were Castula Maria Luisa. So we're gonna start off with uh, Michael Rincon and uh, his question was in the chat. It says, can you, sorry, let me pull this up. Uh, could you explain what the cost under staff costs uh, included? Was it hiring or adjusting staff costs salaries to inflation? That's a question. So um, Megan, I, I believe that you're, you're uh, able to answer this or? Yes. Um, Thanks, Megan. So the cost there is, the change compared to last year is not any additional staff, it's just, you know, like staffing costs increase, salary increases and that sort of thing. I think last year the amount was um, a little over 13.1. So it it's that increase is just for um, the increased staffing costs, but not any new staff. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's uh, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Very good. And then uh, the next person who is asking question is Castelo, uh, followed by Maria Lisa and Emily. Hi, yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you covered a lot. So I was taking down some notes and I, I have several notes that I put down questions and, you know, answer them as time permits. I know that uh, other folks have questions and, and we need to stay on schedule, but I'll just throw them out there and 
you answer um, what you feel you can answer. So on the, um, so one of the things that I, that I jotted down was uh, I put a question on what are pilot projects I, uh, as you were covering the, um, what was set aside as part of the 130 million for the different kind of sections of, of what the money was uh, slotted for. I wanted to get a sense of what pilot project, it was a small number, I think it was like 3 million or 1 million, but I wanted to get a sense of what, what would qualify as a pilot project. Um, and then you mentioned that there was about 47 million that was set aside for uh, what you called uh, interim projects. And you said that that the preference would be that those projects be funded by uh, drought funding. Um, and so the question for me was, um, well, does it just carry over when it's not used? And then uh, if you could just describe in general what technical assistance uh, means. Um, and, then, and then as it relates to the last, one of the last slides uh, on PFAS, on the updates, um, can you, do you, was it, was it the legislation that, that kind of uh, pointed to the, to this fund as a way to fund uh, the PFAS that, that you mentioned uh, in the slide? And then the question that comes up to my mind is whether the board, the State Water Research Control Board feels that, that they could um, set aside some of this funding in the future as we, we get closer to to a chromium six MCL being established. And, and, you know, in my mind, I kind of think of, of systems that are probably going to be out of compliance because of the chromium six. I kind of think of those systems already as systems at risk. And I'm wondering if, if the board feels that, that the, that this uh, particular bucket of funding could be used to start addressing some of those issues or whether that would have to be something that uh, was done through some sort of legislative action. Thank you. Um, so I can do my best to respond to those. I was taking some notes, so hopefully I've got everything mm -hmm. here. Um, the first one about pilot projects, um, you know, generally the types of projects that we've been looking at to date for that are um, related to treatment. And specifically, there's been a few proposed um related to point of use and point of entry. And we'll actually have a presentation later today on a lot of the work that the Division of Drinking Water has been doing around that. And they'll actually specifically cover some of the um, proposed pilot projects that we're looking at potentially funding this coming year. So I think a lot of that may be covered later. Um, for the 47 million for interim, um, so that we wanted to have available for drought needs um, if other drought funding sources are not available. But the other thing that we're looking at funding with that money is also our countywide and regional programs that we're also going to talk about a little bit more um, later in the agenda. But those, again, are geared towards addressing primarily state smalls and domestic wells. And, you know, um, we we did get an allocation of about 50 million in drought funding in the budget this coming year. And so to the extent that projects are eligible and consistent with, you know, being triggered by a drought issue, we're going to try to use those funds. However, you know, some of the countywide and regional program applications that we're seeing coming in are really more geared towards addressing, say, water quality issues. And so we intend to kind of balance using drought funding and safe and affordable funding to meet the needs that we're seeing. Um, and the other part of your question was, you know, if those funds don't get used for that purpose, do they get carried over? And yes, they do. Our funding is continuously appropriated. So, you know, number one, throughout the course of the year, if new um, needs come up, we do have some discretion to sort of shift amongst these categories that we're proposing. Um, and if all of the funding isn't used, then it will definitely carry over to the following year. Uh, the next one was about technical assistance and just kind of explaining what that means. So the way that our technical assistance program runs primarily um, up to this point, we've had agreements with 
nonprofit technical assistance providers um, that we work with as needs are identified to get them assigned to individual systems or communities to help them with a variety of needs that they may have. A lot of the work they do is focused on helping them complete planning for capital projects and get applications in for construction work. They can also do other types of capacity building and that sort of thing, help with rate studies, um, you know, getting up to date on financial statements, training board members, operators. Um, it's pretty broad. So all of that is part of what we tend to fund under our technical assistance agreements. And, you know, as Jeff mentioned in the presentation, we've recently been expanding to um, qualifying for-profit um, technical assistance providers, which we're hoping will allow us to kind of expand our capacity and help more systems. Um, so I hope that answered the question on that. Um, regarding PFAS funding, there was uh, legislation that triggered this as part of the budget um, last year and this year, actually, there were specific funds set aside for PFAS uh, needs. And in addition to that, um, there's going to be some new federal funding that's geared towards emerging contaminants, which can include PFAS. And we expect a lot of that money will also go to support PFAS needs. And so, um, you know, I, I think really though, the question was about whether we would be able to set aside some of our safe and affordable drinking water funding in the future to help address hex chrome needs. Mm -hmm. um, that you know will definitely be something that we're thinking about as the new MCL um, is considered. I think um, you know generally our approach is that if we have other sources we can use for capital projects, that we want to try to do that as much as possible so that we can use safe and affordable for other non-capital things. Um, but you know, for example, there may be a need to identify some specific technical assistance resources around hex chrome or something of that nature. And so those are things that we can think about as we get, you know, closer to that. I think that covered all the bases. And if there's any follow-up on that, let me know. Megan, you did uh, such a wonderful job answering all my questions. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks so much, Megan. And thank you uh, for that question. Castillo. Okay, so up next we have Maria Lisa, uh, followed by Emily, and then followed by Mikey. Maria Lisa. Sí, yo no me quisiera a uh, si puede explicar un poco más acerca de los proyectos capitales y no capitales que son y para qué serán usados. So I think I may have Marina my thing set up incorrectly and I did not hear a translation. I, I've not heard the translation either. Okay. Just, uh, bear with us for a second, please. Yes, I can hear you now. Maria Luisa. <laughs> okay. Megan, can you, can you uh, hear the sí, interpretation? Yo quiero saber acerca de los proyectos capitales y no capitales. ¿Qué son y para qué han sido usados y para qué serán usados en este, en este, uh, para la comunidad? Sure, I can kind of describe um, the differences there. So when we're talking about capital projects, we're, we're talking generally about, you know, actual construction work and, 
you know, often we include the planning associated with that as related to capital projects as well. Um, but for non-capital projects, we're referring to kind of more of the work that can help lead to capital projects if they're needed or just provide support with other needs of the system. So to give some examples, um, for example, if we were going to fund operation and maintenance costs, that is a project that we would not categorize as a capital project, but would still provide a benefit to the system, obviously. Um, also, the administrator work that we do, that is not something that we consider to be a capital cost. That is, um, you know, providing support to the system to help them improve their capacity, potentially help them consolidate if that's feasible and all of that. So that does include some of the planning work towards a capital project at times. Um, and then um, similarly with our technical assistance, you know, again, that's something that we don't really consider to be a capital project, but it does provide a huge benefit to systems and help them address their needs. Um, so hopefully that kind of helps describe the difference, but happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Uh up next, uh, next question comes from Emily. Uh, I believe, Emily, you had included in the chat uh, asking Jeff to please go back to the previous slide with the timeline. Great. Okay. Um, Emily, do you want to ask your question? That was my question. I was taking notes and I couldn't get this down. So okay. that's it. <laughs> Thank okay, you. So now that it's up, do you have any questions on it? <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Well, thanks so much. And then Emily, I'll just mention there too, if you're taking notes off the slide. So it's uh, it's not November 1st anymore. It's October 3rd that we're planning to take it to the board for adoption. October 3rd. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Emily. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, it was a raised hand by uh, Mikey Rincon and then also one by uh, from Cassie. So Mikey, you want, you want to pose your question? Uh, my my question got answered earlier, so it's okay. I'm good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, Cassie. Yeah. Hi. Good after or good morning. Um, I just had a question, either Megan or Jeff, on the slide that showed the metrics and the numbers. I'm curious about the um administrators because i know there was a lot of effort to have that as a tool that could be used but it doesn't seem like they're it's you know administrators completed zero so i'm just wondering if you can expand on that in terms of is that are you anticipating that that um category will be increased over time do you have people kind of in queue that will um, you know, that administrators will end up helping those systems or where are we at with that particular tool? Yeah, I can um, respond to that. And I may actually give Michelle Frederick an opportunity to chime in too, if she wants to, but um, we are gearing up, um, you know, as Jeff mentioned, we execute, well, we executed one uh, administrator agreement, and we have one that's very close to execution. So we'll have two that are working under sort of that master agreement approach so that we'll be able to assign several systems to them. Um, you know, I think we still are looking for more administrators and folks who are interested in doing administrator work because there's certainly a lot of need and we do want to increase our ability to do that over time. And, you know, we have struggled some with some liability issues that they're concerned about in taking on this kind of a role. And so, you know, we've done a lot of work working through the provisions and our agreements with the two that we've established so far. Um, and there was, um, recently new legislation that provides additional protection to administrators um, liability wise. And so we're hoping that that will help us kind of recruit additional potential administrators and have more of that work um, 
completed. And I don't know, Michelle, if you have any more specific numbers on sort of how many we're targeting this coming year, year or anything of that sort, that might be helpful too. Yeah, I think, Cassie, I just want to get back to the question a little bit more because so we have two administrators now, Provost and Pritchard and Stantec, who are both going to have um, what those those master agreements that that um, Megan was mentioning. So what that means is they're going to be able to do multiple systems. So we have already implemented one administrator with um, CRWA um, at North Edwards Water District, but we are, and so that is it's not complete in that the administrator hasn't left yet, but it is in place. Um, the administrator is there technically working. Um, and then the other ones, um, we have we have Provost and Pritchard out in the field and a couple what, um, ones working right now. In, under their master agreement, they're able to go out before they are actually assigned as an administrator to do some like pre-work to allow them to figure out what they're going to need and to write a work plan around that. So they'll be more like technical assistance providers in the way that we fund them. So it won't take so long from the time we find a need to be able to put it in place. So we're hoping, you know, in this fiscal year to be able to get a good portion of the, the um, 13, 14 ones that are already in place really get the administrator out there. So does that yeah, answer your question, Cassie? That's helpful. And I was really driving at, because I, I was aware of the um, new legislation that was just passed to help streamline some of that and reduce some of the liabilities. Yes. So I was wondering if that would factor into maybe expanding the list of administrators and then also, you know, the systems that they could serve. Yeah, we are definitely looking to expand the list. I mean, we are already tapping out the folks that we have. So um, anyone that's interested, please let me know. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. And then I just had one other question related to the expanded list of TA providers. Um, you mentioned expanding that from just our traditional um, nonprofits to for-profit companies. Is that the um, list that would include like engineering firms and uh, legal firms, et cetera? Yeah, I'll let Megan take um, that would include primarily at this point, it's um, engineering firms. Some of them will also be subcontracting with legal firms so that they can kind of provide a full suite of services through a single TA provider. Um, so yes, we're in the process of getting an updated list posted on the website so that folks will be able to track as we add new providers because we are continuously reviewing new requests. Um, or statements of qualification to qualify new providers. And that's what it is to get on that list. You just do a statement of qualifications and you can be considered. That's right, yes. Okay, great, thank you guys. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, next up is Ethel followed by Isabel. So Ethel. Hi. Hi, my question may be for Jeff. This is about the, on the slide on proposed priorities focusing on small DACs and low-income households. Uh, my question is um, regarding the ensuring assistance is distributed consistent with the State Water Board Racial Equity Resolution and Racial Equity Action Plan. Um, how is this being implemented? Like I have applied uh, for several grants with State Water Board and DWR and this is a question that was never asked or even a part of the forum. Um, so how are you implementing this? That's a good question. Yeah, I'll probably punt it back over to Megan. So um, this is a newer thing for us. And we, um, at this point, primarily have started tracking data related to the funding that we provide to public water systems and we're able to get you know data on the demographics of those systems from the census and other similar sources and so you know those are some of the tables that are presented in the FEP now that show you know what percentage of our funding is going to 
lower income or um, communities with a majority minority population and different things of that sort um, so that we can track you know percentage wise how much of our funding is going to those communities and also how that compares to you know the demographics of water systems statewide to ensure that we're, we are targeting the right types of systems. Um, uh, I believe I believe that your demographics or your surveys have been updated early this year. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure. Are you talking about our the income data that we use for, yes, for yes. to qualify uh, for for the low income and that's the right. We the census data for the income specifically is updated annually, and we do technically or typically switch over to the new annual data in, I think, like the March, April timeframe. Um, can you share the link um, on the chat on this uh, new data? Is it possible? Sure. I mean, it's in the presentation, isn't it, Jeff? Can you refer us to the slide? Um, uh, no, the link to get the, to look at the data. It's just, it's not a, just a slide. <laughs> census track medium household income data yes um is there a do you know the link to find that sure i think probably be best if jeff follows up with you after the meeting and we can make sure we get you what you're looking for okay thank okay. you sure thanks very much ethel okay we've got a few more hands uh to go so um next up is uh isabel uh followed by uh Jianmin followed by Sergio, followed by Rami, followed by Horacio. So it's, no, I'm taking you all in queue. <laughs> Isabel, go ahead, please. Okay, sí, uh, mi pregunta es, es acerca de los administradores. Sería para uh, sistemas pequeños eh, y sería administración técnica, nada más, o que específicamente porque dice administrador y como que Quiero que lo desglosen un poco más. Esa es una de las preguntas. La otra, uh, respondiéndome lo, lo del administrador, um, que de lo que es conexión con sistemas, sistemas pequeños, porque a lo que entiendo es sistemas pequeños que tienen problemas y qué tal a conexión con sistemas más grandes. Um, no sé, quisiera un poco más de información sobre eso. Gracias. So um, generally the way that we're gonna be setting up the administrator assistance is where the administrator really takes on the role of managing the whole system, which could include technical aspects and financial aspects or you know, man managerial aspects. Um, there are opportunities for us to do um, what we're calling limited scope administrator assignments, which may be more targeted, but I think in general, it would sort of be the full scope of what I just described. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, regarding the second one, yes, a big focus of our efforts is connecting smaller failing or at-risk systems um, to larger systems that can provide more sustainable services. And so, um, you know, generally we refer to that as consolidation and it's definitely a big focus of uh, a lot of our priorities and funding. And happy to answer any follow-up if I missed part of that. No, está muy bien, sí me contestó y muchas gracias y esperemos que sí se logre llegar a ese punto porque pues mi comunidad está cerca de otra comunidad más grande entonces um, sería genial eh, siempre y cuando este, se respete la equidad eh, de, de nuestras um, residentes eh, que al, al conectarse esos sistemas eh, haya esa igualdad eh, y no lleguemos a tener un problema de, de abuso de control Gracias. Gracias, Isabel. Okay. Um, 
Uh, next up is Jianmen, followed by Sergio, Rami, and Horacio. So Jianmen, your question is in general, how long how long the administrator assistance to the system, how long can administrative assistance to the systems last? And will this be an ongoing assistance? Is that so who can is it, who can who's able to respond to that question? Okay. <clears throat> Michelle, do you want me to take that one? Um, I can take it. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, because there are two perspectives on this. There is the funding perspective, and then there is just the amount of work that needs to be done. When an administrator comes in, one of their first tasks, it, they have two main tasks. One is how are they going to communicate with the community and providing us an engagement plan. And this, by the end of the first year of being there, they need to provide us a post-administrator plan. So within the first year, they're supposed to really think about what needs to be done to get the water system back on its feet and find a sustainable solution for that. So, you know, in some cases, so it's going to differ depending on what is needed. In some cases, it may be, it may take a few years, but they're planning to connect to a larger water system. So once that connection is done, they may leave or um, at some, for some systems that may mean creating some sort of new governance structure that may take a little bit longer. Um, so there is, there is from the, just the amount of work there is no specific set limit. Jeff, I think, and you or Megan can correct me, I think we we currently put in two years in our agreements. Um, and then, you know, we will evaluate how long, um, you know, after that they would need to, um, you know, we could renew it if it was necessary. So um, I think that hopefully answers your question. If not, let me know. Thank you for that, Michelle. Sure, Jamie. Great. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Sekou, you're up next. Yes, thank you. Um, this is in regards to the um, proposed um, uh, contract agreements with private uh, technical providers. I think it's definitely um, a great opportunity. We have a lot of um, for profits, meaning like specifically thinking, uh, engineering firms that definitely need to um, uh, contribute to this. And there is opportunities to work with them. Um, uh, doing this kind of infrastructure project requires two things. Number one is uh, engage the community, do a lot of outreach, a lot of a community organizing, and make sure that the community has uh, a decision making on the priorities for infrastructure, in this case, drinking water. And the second is, after you have all the community organized and, and making a strong case about their priorities, then the uh, engineering comes to play. So the question I have is, once the state water boards provide these contracts to these firms, um, how, how the process of uh, interaction or coordination will be between these for-profit uh, technical assistance providers that have no clue, no understanding about the culture of the communities, disadvantaged communities being served with uh, the, uh, the groups that are doing community organizing outreach together with the community, uh, how this is going to interact. So I think it's very important that that this process can be coordinated. Uh, other, other, otherwise, it won't definitely be a communication. And, and as it was stated before, uh, the whole entire point is to make sure that the community uh, are at the forefront on making the decisions about the priorities for drinking waters in their community. So I can... Um respond to that one. Uh, so I think it's something we're going to be working through as we move forward. In general, um, you know, we do have the ability in some cases, if we know there's going to be a lot of community outreach need, and especially if there's already an established nonprofit that is working with that community, 
you know, we have the potential to assign two providers, one to focus more on like engagement and outreach and another to focus more on the technical work. So that may be something that we use in some cases, you know, in other cases, there may be pretty straightforward technical needs. Like they just need a new tank designed and we need to just get that done and get their application in and move it forward. And so some of those that are more technical and straightforward in nature would certainly be ones that we would target towards the engineering firms. Um, and so it's, you know, it's going to be a little bit case by case and a judgment call of our staff working together with the list of providers to determine, you know, what is the best fit for a given need. Um, and also, you know, some of these engineering firms that we're going through the approval process with now are already actively working um, with a lot of small disadvantaged communities, and they do have folks in-house that have expertise with running community meetings and helping with those aspects with communities. So again, it's just kind of a matter of um, matching the needs with the resources that are going to best fit that situation. Thank you. Thanks, Sergio. Thanks, Megan. Okay, up next is Rami. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we've heard a lot of discussion here today about technical assistance providers, and I think that's driven because, you know, that represents the bulk of the safer fund spending that's being done on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, the question I have for the group is, this, is the state water board planning to audit these um, technical assistance providers to make sure that they're actually assisting small water companies, because if they're not, then, uh, you know, residents will be losing uh, who, who are suffering from, you know, bad quality water. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, the way that our uh, technical assistance agreements are set up, the providers aren't able to start working with a given system or community until we um, issue what we call an assistance request um, to them to say that, you know, we've evaluated their needs and we think you're the best fit provider. So, you know, before they even start working with the system, we're already looking at whether they're small and disadvantaged and they qualify for technical assistance. Um, you know, and then also just to give a little bit more insight into how our process works, we do have staff that are reviewing quarterly progress reports from the providers to see the progress they're making and, you know, to track the work that's being done with the individual systems that each provider is assigned to. Um, and so all of that will sort of play into keeping uh, providers accountable. Um, we also, as part of um, developing responses to the audit findings, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, are gonna be working specifically on developing some key performance indicators to track the progress of technical assistance providers. And so that will be another tool that we have that will be applied you know, to all the providers, uh, the nonprofit and for-profit. Thanks, Megan. So at this point, um, I'm, we're gonna take one more question and that's from Horacio. Uh, the we will have an opportunity to discuss this this particular topic a little bit more in the breakout session. So uh, please make sure folks who, who are waiting to ask a question and it was uh, Castillo and Ested will go ahead and continue that in our breakout session. So we'll go ahead and take one last question from Horacio. Horacio, thank you for your patience. Go ahead and ask your question, please. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yeah, I was in the waiting room and I got kicked out and I was not able to join again, but uh, I'm in the phone, it's okay. Um, I have a, I, I do have some questions, but the very main one is, is how do we, how do we coordinating with the counties about doing something to help the residents of each county 
to fix their their water problems when many water systems don't have um, agencies or administrators administrators helping them to get the water system fixed. So I think the county and the state water board are public entities and there's got to be a coordination on how uh, the county is going to help the the communities get clean water. So my question is, which counties are are uh, what are the counties are doing to coordinate with the state water board to get clean water to their residents? Michelle, I'm going to see if you want to respond to this first, but I'm happy to otherwise. You can go ahead. I, I think I was just going to talk about the um, state small domestic well program. Here. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely um, something that we'll cover again later in the agenda. Um, that is an opportunity for counties to apply for funding to help specifically state smalls, which are those small systems that um, are not public water system. So they serve um, generally less than 15 connections or 25 people, I believe is how it's defined. So those those types of household, kind of more household level needs, um, we do have those opportunities available and we can talk a little bit more in the presentation later about, mm -hmm. you know, which counties we have funded to date and that sort of thing. Um, you know, we do have some partnerships with different counties to help us address the needs of public water systems as well. Um, it's sort of a little bit more case by case, I would say. And, um, you know, depending on the needs and what kind of role they can fill. Um, but like one example would be in Tulare County where we have the county um, teed up to play the role of an administrator for a water system, for example. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Michelle, go for it. Yeah, I mean, in Sonoma County, we also have them teed up That's right. as an administrator. That's right, yeah. So it, it does kind of depend on how, what kind of participation we're getting from the county. Yeah, um, yeah, I think, I think the counties should be responsible just for helping the residents because this has been going for a long time <clears throat> and many residents within our counties, they just tell them your system out of compliance, don't drink the water and that's it. So not, we're not gonna be able to fix the water problems that exist if the state water board and the counties work together and figure out a way of uh, of helping all the water systems that are out of compliance because uh, this is a, um, a problem that industries like the agriculture and petrochemicals that I have created over the years and we need to face it and not be postponing it. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely been coordinating with all the counties to share out information about the statewide and regional or the countywide and regional funding programs that we have available. Um, we've been doing a lot of outreach to them to try to bring them in and encourage them. Um, so, you know, we definitely are working on it. It's a work in progress, I would say. Great. Okay, well, we'll see when more information comes up. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that comment, uh, Horacio and Megan. Thank you for, for uh, responding to that um, in such great detail. Appreciate that. So folks, that's going to be the last uh, comment question we'll take uh, for this particular section. We're going to move on to take our first break of the day, and that's going to be a 10-minute break. So um, 
let's resume. It is now 1129, almost 1130. So let's get, let's rejoin at 1140. So that's 1140, 1140 AM. We'll see you back at 1140. Hi, Mark. This is Haiti. Um, you are now in the main room. If you could, um, if we can just test your audio. One moment, Mark. Uh, we're going to remove you as an interpreter so that you could join us in the main room. Okay, Mark, um, in a moment, you should be able to um, test your audio here in the main room.
All right. Welcome back, folks. It's 1141. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so next slide, please. All right, well, welcome back everyone. Uh, we will now move into breakout groups. The goal for our breakout session is to get back on the draft fund expenditure plan that we were just discussing uh, before break, uh, which will include priorities, funding category allocations, and um, allocations of funds on certain project types. The, there will be two breakout groups. I will facilitate breakout room number one, and Marina will facilitate the main room. Those of you who are asked to join the breakout room number one, when we start the breakout session, you'll see a pop-up window on your screen and you'll click, you'll want to click on join. As a reminder, uh, speak slowly to ensure that our interpreters can capture all, all of your feedback. And then also um, for, for the group that will have the Spanish speakers, if, um, if they do speak in Spanish, you, um, we will have an interpreter in that room to interpret that. So we are working that out um, as we noticed that we uh, were not able to do that earlier. And so we are going to do that for the breakout session. So I hope that helps for uh, most of you folks. Uh, for the breakout session, you'll also need a materials packet and PowerPoint slides that we provided uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, we'll also add the links um, to the materials if, uh, if you need that available as well. Next slide. So other than what we have already discussed uh, during the Q&A after Jeff's presentation. What other feedback do you have on funding priorities, allocation, and recommendations towards certain project types? In your breakout group, we will use a round robin, meaning we will call your name so that we can hear feedback from everyone in the group. We ask that you please wait your name to be called then. If there is time, we can open it up for additional comments. As a reminder, refer to your materials packet and PowerPoint slides to answer these questions. For question one, you can refer to page two in the materials packet. Also for your PowerPoint slides that uh, you also have a copy of, you can um, go to slide 18. For question two, you can go to page four and then also slide 19. Um, and for for question three, uh, we would like your recommendations on allocated funds for certain project types, and that includes interim water supplies and, and emergencies, technical assistance, and planning and construction. Are there any questions before we go into our breakout groups? Okay, don't see any hands. All right, so at this time, I would like to ask Caroline and Lourdes, uh, who are currently sharing their PowerPoints, to stop sharing so that everyone can turn on their videos uh, for participation in the breakout session. And then if we can stop sharing the Spanish PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. All right, so now I'd like uh, Kristen um, to lead us into the breakout groups now. As a reminder, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. All right, let me just check. Uh, to make sure that we have everyone here. Okay. Um, Horacio, are you with, with us? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, 
give me one second. Okay. Yes, now I see you all. Um, <laughs> I'm toggling between so many screens. So uh, thank you for your patience. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, we will now, um, before we get started, actually, I like to um, have a volunteer to report out to the larger group. So meaning what we discuss here, you're just gonna summarize what we discussed so that the other folks know, um, you know, what feedback you had in this uh, breakout session. So um, do I see a hand raised for this? Anyone that would like to report out to the group? Okay, great, Cassie, thank you so much. All right, Cassie. Um, and then also I'd like to welcome um, our subject matter experts. We have Megan and Jeff from the Division of Financial Assistance. We also have Michelle from the Division of Drinking Water. And let's see, am I missing anyone else? Give me a second. Um, I think, I think that's all that we have for now. All right, so with that, I, um, I will uh, proceed. So we have three questions, which I will now put in the chat. Um, give me a second. So in case you don't have your packets available, I'll just put it in the chat so that you can look at it. Um, I'm gonna put it in the chat both uh, English and Spanish. Um, just so that the other groups can see it too. Okay, all right, so it's in the chat now. And then also just uh, as a reminder, please, um, in your meeting packet, you'll turn to page two and four to answer uh, question one and two, and then also for question, um, and then also slides 18 and 19. So at this time, we will ask you to write down your thoughts. Um, you, on these questions. And then after 10 minutes, I'll give you about 10 minutes. Um, maybe any more time than, you know, I, I can do that, but I'll circle back to you all to just make sure that you had enough time to answer those questions on your own. If you can just write those down and then I will uh, call your name and then you can provide your feedback. Um, I do ask that, it, that you limit your time, uh, your responses to five minutes or less so that we can hear from everyone. We have about, I'm going to say about 40 minutes or so uh, for this discussion. So I'd like to um, go through all the questions and of course, get all your feedback on that. So um, I will say at 12 o'clock, um, I'll circle back to you, both, to you all and go from there. Uh, so you can turn off your camera if you need to think, and that's fine. But when you're ready to go, you can uh, turn on your camera too, and and that will give me, you know, that that will give me a clue that okay, you're you're uh, ready to provide your feedback. So um, I'll let you be right now. And for Lourdes, if you could uh, let me know, um, you're working behind the scenes. Let me know if you're good on your end, also. Okay, perfect.
Hello? Yes, Michael. Are we in a breakout room? When are we going to? Yes, yes, we're in a breakout room. And um, at this time, we are allowing you to take down your thoughts on, on those questions that I put in the chat. And then I will circle back in about eight minutes at 12 o'clock. And so that I can, and I will call on you folks and you can provide your feedback. So um, if you could just take a few minutes uh, to look at these questions, look at the slides and then also the meeting packet and then that, um, and then we'll circle back. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the questions are on uh, the slide number 25. Horacio, I think this they're in the chat if you want to look at the chat. Yeah, but I'm I'm in the phone. Okay. Um they're on the copy I have their slide number 27. Their number one, what feedback do you have on the funding priorities? Number two, what feedback do you have on funding allocations? And number three, how would you recommend more or less allocating funds towards certain types of projects? Okay, got it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Sure.
Okay. I don't see anyone's camera on, so I'm going to ask here, um, do we need maybe a couple more minutes? Maybe a few just to uh, okay. uh, put uh, thoughts together. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, well, I'll, I'll circle back at 12.05 um, and go from there. Thank you. Katie. Do you have a timeline? I, I may not be the best, best note taker because I'm going to have to transition here in a little bit. What's the timeline for this particular item? Um, for this, uh, we are scheduled to come back to the larger group about 1240 um, so that we can share what we discussed here. And then we'll um, after that, we'll break into lunch at 12, well, around 1250. If, if we're good on time, it's 1250 that we go into lunch. Does that work for you? Yeah, that's right about the time that I'll have to be transitioning. So as long as we are on time, then yeah, I should be fine. Okay, all right, Thanks. thank you. Uh, Heidi, I might volunteer to start providing some feedback uh, while the other ones are, are needing more time. Um. 
if if we can sit tight just for a couple more minutes. Oh, um, that's fine. Yeah, because I just... have a list of yeah, I have a, a list of folks that I you know I'm gonna just call out on and then go from there. Is sure, that, no problem. Is that okay? No problem. All right, Sounds good. So much. All right, thank you, Sergio. five. So I will start calling out names and I'd like to hear your feedback. And so I will, uh, I'll name the first three and then we can go from there. So I have Jennifer, Dawn, and Sandra. So that's the order that will go. So um, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so I do not have any feedback on the funding allocations or, and I don't have any recommendations on allocations, but I do have a couple of questions on the funding priorities. Okay. Um, so I'd like to know what the difference is between emergency funding and interim solution as, as it pertains to bottled water, because we work with a lot of communities um, and when we're, putting together the scope of work for the TA, you know, nine times out of 10, they're in an emergency situation and they need bottled water or hot water. And typically we've, in the past, we've gone to um, a cleanup and abatement application, which takes a long time to get approved and awarded. So I wonder, does emergency bottled water fall under the emergency priority or the interim solution? And can it be funded out of TA? Great question. Um, do we have, let's see, Michelle or Megan or Jeff? Can we, uh, can you help out in answering Jennifer's question? I think that sounds more like a funding priority question. So I'll kick it over to DFA folks. Thanks, Michelle. I can help a bit. I apologize. My video is not cooperating today. So um, you guys are just going to get my voice. Um, so let's see the, the emergency funding category, um, I think generally is different because we may fund things that are more like a pump replacement or 
a repair or a replacement of a well if a system like has an outage or something like that, for example. Um, that said, we really use the same urgent drinking water needs application process either way. So it may be sort of like splitting hairs. <laughs> um, but um, I think to your question about funding bottled water under TA, I think there is, you know, potential efficiencies to be had there. My one concern would be that I know there's probably only certain TA providers who would be interested in providing bottled water and doing that kind of a service, and there's others who wouldn't be. And so it might almost be more efficient to have a separate, you know, like statewide or regional program where those given providers who are willing to provide that kind of service would be able to tap whichever systems, regardless of whether they're receiving TA from another different provider that isn't willing to provide that kind of service. Does that make sense? Something I'm thinking like parallel to the bottled water for schools program, for example, but yeah. geared towards addressing public water systems instead. So emergency and urgent funding is still under cleanup and abatement. And, and I, I understand that planning efforts are under TA, but so where are how do you fund interim solutions? Well, I wouldn't get too hung up on cleanup and abatement. We actually aren't really using that much of that actual funding source anymore. We more so use the safe and affordable funding, but it's the same urgent drinking water needs application process, regardless of the funding source. Does okay. that help? That answers my question. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Jennifer. Um, next up, we have Don. Okay, great. We'll come back to Don, um, but we'll go now to Sandra. Um, I think as of now, the priorities that we have, they're pretty much on point what we need to be focusing on. But for me, it's more now about strategy. And I think that's what we're gonna focus on the second part of this meeting. Um, yeah, I think as of now, everything seems okay for me. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Sandra. All right, uh, so now um, we'll go with Jan Janmeen, James, and Cassie. So that's the order that we'll go. Hi, everyone. Um, I kind of agree with Sandra. She used a strategy. I will use like an implementation. So we have the priorities and I agree with that. But I'm thinking about how are we going to implement those priorities? Specifically for me, you know, um, how to help with the domestic well owners, and perhaps state small water systems as well. And for example, in my county, I identify a couple of small communities. They are on, I mean, 100% of them, they're on individual wells. <laughs> so I can see the benefit of a um, regionalization perhaps, and perhaps creating a new community water system and I want to see, you know, my county and can get, can play a, a kind of an active role in that because we really at the local and we know them, we know the communities, we issue the permits and so on. So my thought is that how would, um, I made a comment earlier that we don't have the staff we don't have the money, but how can we spend time to implement this statewide program to help individual well owners, right? So I'm thinking perhaps, you know, as if we have the need, we go to the state and is that possible that we can work with this one designated employee 
and that designated employee perhaps can spend majority of his or her time helping this particular project? Or is there a funding available to the county upfront so that we can hire an employee to take on this project? So I guess we just need to have more dialogue and, and, and figure out a strategy or implementation approach. I Thank think you. that's all. I don't have any questions for the alloca allocations. Okay, great. Thank you, Jermaine. Mm -hmm. um, Megan or Jeff, would you like to um, add to that? Well, I mean, I think as far as um, working with your particular county on the countywide application and how to make all of those kinds of details work, that's probably better for an offline discussion. Um, I guess the only other thing I would say that we can potentially do with the scenario like you described, even you know, absent some kind of countywide program is um, we can potentially get, if there's like a, a group of uh, homes on domestic wells that have good regionalization potential, it may be possible to get them assigned to technical assistance to at least start doing some initial planning work and figure out, you know, feasibility and kind of get some of that initial work going and try to identify sort of what entity would potentially take the lead on construction and all of those sort of like key questions that are important to actually developing a project. Great. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Janine. Um, Sandra, I do see that you have your, your hand raised. Um, can we come back to you after I go through the list? All right, great, thank you. All right, so uh, we will now go to James. Myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the priorities uh, seem um, you know, in, in line. I, I think I'd, I'd agree with Jamin about um, the need for um, more maybe interface with counties on uh, especially private wells um, and getting more of a, a local uh, presence to be able to interact with um, uh, communities uh, and folks that are on private wells and areas that um, you know, might be more receptive to local presence, um, providing, you know, assistance or trying to um, gather interest um, to look into potential issues. Um, so I, I think that's, that's kind of, um, I think the priorities are fine and the funding allocations are fine, um, but I, I think we might be missing a lot of opportunities um, that we're not reaching the people that that really are in need of some of the assistance, um, you know, uh, especially water quality issues like arsenic and and um, uh, nitrates. You know, that's something that somebody on a private well would know that they had a problem unless they they sample. And um, most folks don't sample their water wells, even though you know it's recommended and and always a great idea. So I, I think maybe at the county level would be where you'd want to start, and then those local um, agencies um, that that would be um, um, responsible uh, that could interact with those type of folks get some type of more um, um, of an inroad with those folks to be able to to gather that interest. And I apologize, my dog is over here and she's having a, uh, a nightmare, I think. So you might have heard some weird sounds. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, we don't hear her, so we're good. Oh, okay. So I shouldn't have said a word. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and I do have one other thing to, to kind of uh, mention about um, one of the concerns I have. Uh, with uh, the addition of PFAS 
um, into um, this program. I, I think it's, a, it's a, truly a concern that, you know, it's a emergency contaminant, um, but, but that, that could eat into a lot of uh, the budget um, for this program if, you know, things are being found um, and maybe it would be better um, housed in an, another uh, program. Um, I mean, not the outreach portion of it, if a portion is, or if it's found, um, but just dealing with the PFAS issue, it, it can get pretty uh, uh, tricky fast. Great, thank you, Jim. I can just add one clarification on that one, Heidi. Um, that right now we are not necessarily dedicating a specific portion of the safe and affordable funding source for PFAS. Um, there was dedicated general fund money for that purpose in the budget and the state budget. Um, and then also as far as implementation goes, I think I mentioned real briefly that we have this federal money for emerging contaminants that's coming through our, and we'll be funding those projects through our Drinking Water State Revolving Fund program. So um, in the near term, I think there's a lot of sort of very targeted funding sources that we'll be able to use to avoid significant impacts to this program. Okay, thanks. Sure. Great. Thanks, Megan and Jim. Um, next up, we have uh, Cassie, and then after Cassie, we'll have Ethel and Horacio. Yeah, thank you, Haiti. Um, I I did have just sticking with the questions. Um, I'm really a fan of trying to put the money toward this the permanent solution, and I know that's much easier than said than done. I'm very familiar with that, but I would I would really like to emphasize the priority being on the permanent solutions. And I think TA is great. I think it's amazing that we're going to be expanding TA providers to include um, other types of assistance that is going to be needed. And to the extent possible, I think, and I've said it before, I think we need to stay focused on the primary concern and before we start branching out. And I, I'm specifically talking about the community water systems that are still out of compliance and, um, you know, addressing those needs just so that we don't get diluted in, you know, how we're addressing the problem. The other thing in terms of priorities, I think if it's at all possible um, to, and I don't know where it fits in, in, maybe it fits in kind of all of them, but leveraging existing programs to expand the, the realm of possibilities, like with the um, nitrate control program and the management zones and the GSAs. I mean, every single GSP that was submitted says something about a domestic well mitigation program. And so really trying to leverage what's currently available through other programs so that we can really spend the safer money on um, you know, what it was intended to be spent on it and, and really address the, the, the systems that are remaining out of compliance. Um, and then the other, in terms of the allocations, you, I, I would really like to see more money dedicated towards the administrator program. I just am a firm believer that some folks are going to need some additional assistance in terms of, you know, helping them along, helping them get into a position. And I just think that that's going to be best provided with an administrator. And so the $5 million that's allocated for that particular fund seems um, maybe on the lower side. And then also on the direct O&M support in terms of the, um, the affordability component, maybe that needs to be increased because permanent solutions are expensive. And so, you know, maybe there needs to be more direct O&M um, support. So that those are the two categories that I I would um, vote to have you know maybe some additional dollars allocated towards those and really see an expanded use of the administrator administrator program now that we have some folks that have bought in and we have legislation that helps address some of the other issues. So that is my feedback. Thank you, Cassie. 
I'm next. <laughs> um, my feedback um, for, for the funding priorities. Um, I, I'm glad that, that we have priorities in place and I, I, I do agree with them. Um, the thing is, uh, as a small a mutual water company, um, I am experience, experiencing, you know, going through this, uh, this thing, you know, um, and my feedback is, it takes a very long time. You cannot really have an urgent project <clears throat> because I would say my project for our mutual water company is urgent and we're already more than a year um, into this process. Um, we did the TA planning for in, uh, plan and design. And then after that, we have to wait. And then after that, we have to apply again for another TA for construction. So I'm just saying that in terms of timeline, um, there's it takes a very long time. Um, for the allocations, my feedback is, um, just like Cassie, I ad agree that you know there is a more need for administ an administrator. Like in this part of uh, <clears throat> California, uh, we are pretty much on our own. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, you know the county doesn't help you, and there's really nobody that we can approach or ask. Um, and looking at this, I see that uh, there's 13.3 million allocated to the interim water supplies, while there's only 5 million um, allocated for construction. Uh, our very small water company would already take half of this. So I don't know when are we all going to get it if this is the year um, budget. And, and, and it says here that there's zero allocation for planning. Um, the planning for our small water company would be about 600,000. And that's engineering plan and design. So we're working on that. But if I don't see any allocation, would that mean that we will not be approved or we will just be pushed to next year? Um, so number three, what would you recommend more or less allocated? I would recommend more funding on the construction um, because there's so much on the, um, on the TA and uh, you cannot just be on technical assistance and holding a plan. Uh, things should materialize. Uh, because this is the water that we're drinking. We want safe drinking water. I'm done. Thank you, Ethel. So the only thing I wanted to add there um, to help explain sort of why we have funds allocated the way we do for planning and construction with a low allocation from the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, um, if you go to slide 17 from the presentation that uh, Jeff was going through, there's a slide that helps demonstrate how much funding we are we have allocated to the board for capital projects and then um, sort of other more unique projects like interim technical assistance administrators, o &M. And so of our total of 1.15 billion, there's about a little more than 800 million available for capital projects for planning and construction from other funding sources like the general fund and our state revolving fund program. So although we're not allocating safe and affordable drinking water funds, there are a lot of funds available right now to do planning and construction through other funding sources. And that's sort of why we've um, limited the allocation of safe and affordable for that purpose. Thanks, Megan. Um, next, we have, uh, I see Horacio, Sergio, and then we'll go to Michael. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you, Horacio. Okay. Um, I think we, we need to have some funds for, um, private and domestic wells. Uh, we need to have some um, outreach to make sure that people are not getting poisoned with contaminated water. It's very important that people know the quality of the water. Um, also, we, we need to have uh, money for administrators and the county to work together on how they're gonna uh, 
uh, coordinate water systems that can be uh, that can be uh, put together in in a place where they have good water quality because uh, many of the of the residents in any county they they they're not applying they don't have time to to uh to go through all the the paperwork and the time in order to get a grant i think this this role should be uh the administrators in the counties because uh most of the water contamination is being done by uh, by industries that are over extracting the water and polluting the water. So there should be money for that. And um, yeah, and there should be more money on on projects because uh, a lot of, of the of the water systems that are that are not getting any funds, they, it takes a long time. So at least it, it, if you start a project, you have some hopes that you're gonna finish it. And many people, they just been waiting for decades. And if we don't coordinate with the administrators and the county and the state water board, it's gonna take a long time to get the, the problem fixed. And if, if we don't do something about it, people are just gonna lose hope on, on public entities. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's nobody to help them. And besides, they didn't pollute the water. So, Anyway, that's my comment. Sergio, Sergio, thank you so much for your patience. Sure, no problem. Um, you know, I I totally agree with the um, the comments that some colleagues uh, have uh, expressed regarding um, how can we do or how can we actually um, have a better response when it comes to emergencies. Uh, overall, the allocation um, is really well. We have not uh, come out with that issue that, oh my gosh, you know what? We should have been allocating more funding for this particular you know, category, uh, you know, either future water consolidation, well repairs, or interim solution, uh, whatever you want to name it. Uh, I think it has been very balanced and it has been kind of, um, you know, uh, fairly distributed and, and it has been very effective. So, but when it comes to priorities, I believe it's not much about funding allocation. It is more about how can we be more agile and responding to the needs to the community. <clears throat> we all know by experience, we have learned for a while already that water consolidation projects takes longer. Uh, we are probably averaging five, five years. Uh, I have never seen a project uh, done uh, faster than that. Um, so in the meantime, yes, is the, the interim solutions is definitely the response um, uh, to those uh, long-term investments. But the question is not about allo allocation. Uh, the question is, how can we respond faster when there is emergencies? When I, I Pueblo Nido receive a lot of phone calls from the community, like they have sand in the well, and what can we do about it? And, and people start to struggle. And we don't have, per se, a mechanism to, oh my gosh, just, just to make a phone call, or send a quick email, and send pictures about and the location of the well, look at the conditions of the well, and look at the water uh, with a lot of sand, and it's impacting the, 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 you know, the health of the community. 
uh, what can we do to actually put together an application um, that it can be done rather quickly. So the question is, can, can this be realistic to, to respond to those emergency situations, especially now that you see a lot of issues going on in California with related to climate change and other stuff. So is it reasonable to request like to have at least a, 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 a timetable of 90 days to actually get, get an application going? or at least to have an agreement to, to proceed with, with, with the application and then we could get reimbursed uh, later. And the other question that is never resolved that I know that, that, that we need to be patient because uh, the State Water Board has indicated that they're working on this. There's still uh, an uncertainty of uh, families who are served by uh, lateral connections going to be 100% uh, grants. We still uh, 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 don't have any answer of that. And many of the projects are pretty soon gonna start uh, to be built. Uh, construction will, will commence rather quickly. So we still need to be prepared for that. And, um, and the third thing that I wanna use to provide feedback, I know that this is not related to drinking water. I know the safer is related to specifically to drinking water, but I just want to use to share that there is also the concern about uh, finding a location for fire protection, especially now with these fires that we have, especially in those rural areas. So what can we do or how can fire protection can fit within the efforts that we're all doing to provide drinking water? Because this is also a secondary benefit that the community can, can take advantage of. So those are the three feedbacks that I want to use to kind of provide. Thank you, Sergio. And I'll just say, Haiti, I think I have some ideas on some of those things, but we're short on time. So Sergio, we'll just follow up with you, you know, offline. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Michael Prado, and then we'll come back to Sandra. Um, but yes, we do have five more minutes left. Michael Prado, can you hear me? Yes. We hear um, you. On the priority, prioritized list you have, on the first one, it has uh, emergency or urgent funding needs only where there are no other funds available. What, what does that mean? You have to look other places before safer money can be used? Is that what that means? So for example, we have a specific allocation this year and we did last year also to address drought needs. Mm -hmm. So if we have a need that comes in that we can fund under a source like that, then our preference is to use those funds to sort of preserve safe and affordable funding for other needs. Um, and there's also, you know, several other agencies that we coordinate with on things like drought funding. And so sometimes we are able to help a system and direct them to other funding sources, even outside the board that could be a good fit. So um, I think oh. primarily that's what we're talking about. Okay, got you. Um, now, there is a, a funding program. I don't know who it's under the state, maybe, I don't know, for drought impacted emergencies, right? Mm -hmm. So they would have to go there first, let's say, and then if uh, need be, same for when then help out? Yeah, potentially, if, if there was nothing else that could satisfy the need. Okay. Now on the- I think, Megan, just real quick on that point, Michael, I think, um... It's just a single point though, right? Does DFA still determine what the best suite of options is to fund that particular solution? Isn't that the way it works? It's not like the applicant has to go to four or five different locations to figure out how to get assistance. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we wouldn't make you apply to three different state board programs. We'd give you some initial guidance on which is the best fit. And it, for the most part, any of those types of things are gonna go through a single application process, like Cassie said, and then we just figure out internally which funding source is the best fit. 
Um, if, for example, we thought you were going to be a great fit for funding through USDA or something, we would coordinate with them. And if they agreed, we might point you to their application process. I see. Thank you. And then for um, the allocation, I think um, I'm in agreement with a lot of you out there. Um, there should be more money set for the domestic well owners. And uh, a TA assistance, that's a big issue. And I know there's um, several um, organizations working at trying to get that uh, where there's more TA assistance available. And I know a lot of us are excited and waiting to see when that's going to happen, hopefully soon. And then I'm uh, part of a consolidation and it's taking too long for a project. Well, right now there's a, a group forming that has formed already and had meetings. It's uh, called the L6S TA Planning for Consolidation Project Teamwork. And that team there is trying to get things together. How it's be being done now and what can be done to eliminate some of the time occupied, maybe cutting down from a uh, five year to maybe half that time, maybe two, two and a half, if not better. So that's working and play as we speak. And that's all I have. I'll let somebody else finish whatever time to now. Thank you, Michael. All You're right. Welcome. Uh, Sandra, we have a few more minutes left, so I'd like to circle back to you. Sandra? Oh, oh you're on mute. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Okay, I wanted to ask if it was possible to add into the interim solutions um, research opportunities to research more about um, emerging, uh, emerging, not nitrates, contaminants. Um, so on, a, on my domestic well, we have about four or five times the MCL of nitrates. And I am also curious to know, um, like how does that affect my skin? How does that affect me in terms of absorption rather than um, consumption? I already know it's not good for consumption, but what about for my plants? What about for the livestock that my family has? Because I'm assuming that sometime in the future, if my well happens to go dry, once more or another issue arises will be connected to um, a larger city, like a public water system. But I'm wondering if the opportunity arises that we could still use the domestic well water for other things, if that would affect us. So I'm just wondering if maybe we could add um, opportunities for research or would that be through another program? Like one that you mentioned earlier, I think it was the Drinking Water State Revolve Program or maybe another one that has been made for nitrates for specific contaminants. Just, I wanna see what space we have for research. And also another question that I had was, um, Jian Min, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but um, you mentioned something about um, domestic wells, kind of making it more like a community focusing on domestic wells more, um, locally so maybe if it's possible like someone someone else mentioned earlier about uh, if it's possible to put it in a certain region i'm wondering if it's already if said communities are already in a region uh do gsas have anything to do with this or management zones and how can we make that entire process just a little bit better because in my personal experience of being part of a gsa um I never really get any kind of communication from them directly. I always have to do it through community water center. And a lot of times domestic well owners, they're left to advocate for themselves. And I personally, I'm not the owner, but eventually I will be the owner of said land. Right now it's my father. And the thing is that a lot of people are not focusing on right now is that these issues, we're leaving them to our children you know, and we need to make them a little bit easier for our children to navigate. And right now I am the child of a domestic well owner 
trying to see what the future looks like for the land that I was raised on and for the land that I would like to eventually raise my own children on. So yeah, I just wanna see what roles do the GSAs have and management zones and how can we make it a little bit better in terms of communication as well? Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Um, with that, I we're, we're actually already out of time. And so we're gonna go ahead and um, go back to large group. So thank you everyone for your comments. I do appreciate your feedback. We have taken some notes so that we can get that um, over to you for review in a few weeks. And see you back in the main room. Okay, we're ready to get started. It's 1245 and uh, ready for this next section. So, so for this portion, uh, the last portion before a lunch break, uh, we're going to ask the reporter, the designated reporter from each breakout group from breakout room one and the main room to provide uh, the feedback, a summary of the feedback they received, uh, they noted down in their groups. So we'll, we ask the report out be taken um, be provided in about five minutes or less. And so um, we want to make sure that we can uh, have, take this time to, to listen to the, the comments and um, kind of think about what do you think is the most important for the state water boards to address. So let's start with uh, breakout group one reporter. Will the reporter um, identify themselves and please provide the feedback that you jotted down for your group? Yeah, hi, Cassie Chahan. I'm going to be reporting out for group one, and we had a lively discussion. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so um, in general, I think the consensus from our group was that the priorities seem to be appropriate and well identified. Um, there were a lot of questions about implementation and strategy and the importance of getting that part right through proper coordination, possibly utilization of the counties, um, so that, and the GSAs, there was even a fair amount of commentation, uh, comments related to GSA involvement. And so really trying to, while the priorities are good, it really is important to get the implementation and the strategy correct and make sure that we have the proper resources dedicated. So really, ensuring that we can implement timely solutions. There was a lot of discussion related to the timing that it takes um, for solutions to be implemented. And um, that was kind of the genesis for discussion related to um, the strategy and really making sure that we have good strategy associated with each of the priorities and, and being able to be successful with achieving the goals that are set for those priorities. Um, there was also um, a fair amount of discussion on administrators and the need for administrators, um, the need to um, expand that administrator program and really utilize the, that tool um, and make sure, again, I mean, it's all aimed at getting solutions implemented as quickly as possible. 
There was also a fair amount of discussion on technical assistance and what does that mean? How can we utilize that to implement permanent solutions while also offering interim solutions um, such as the bottled water program or the hauled water programs? There was also a fair amount of discussion on the outreach piece and making sure that people know um, what resources are available and or impacts associated with um, wells that have elevated concentrations of contaminants such as nitrate and um, you know, just really keep continuing to expand the outreach so that people are aware and people know uh, kind of the health risk associated with consumption of water that doesn't meet the drinking water standards. Um, there was a fair amount of discussion also on utilization of the counties and, and their, particularly as it relates to domestic well owners and state small water systems, utilizing the counties and their expertise and the boots on the ground to be able to really um, implement that prior or achieve the goals that are set in that priority and possibly um, advance money to the counties to aid in those solutions. There was also comment related to a focus on permanent solutions and really trying to keep the eye on the prize, if you will, and making sure that we are doing everything within our power and control to get those permanent solutions implemented to in the fastest way possible. So I think I think those are the big ticket items. Um, there was, like I said, just not so much a discussion about rearranging the priorities, but with the given priorities, having a good strategy associated with every single one of them and ensuring that the right partners are in place so that we can be uh, efficient about implementing those priorities and achieving the goals. I can't hear you from Marina. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, sorry. No, that sounds fantastic. Looks like you had a pretty robust conversation. So very good. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go on to our next group. So thank you so much for that report out, Cassie. Um, we'll go out to, to Rami. He was the reporter for, um, for the main group. So Rami. All right, good pass afternoon. Pass it on to you. Yeah. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, since uh, I'm, I'm between now and lunch, I'll make it fast. Uh, <laughs> we uh, we had a very vigorous discussion, good discussion with lots of diverse viewpoints expressed. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to sum it up, we could say there's uh, more needs than dollars. Uh, the State Water Board uh, staff came on as remind us, reminded us of the constraints of the uh, safer funding and the focus areas there on disadvantaged communities. Uh, there was no consensus per se reached in our group. Uh, one thing that we did have agreement on was I, I would say focus on unincorporated rural areas, uh, more funds for at-risk systems as well as private wells, which I think mo uh, most of all of us agreed with. There are lots of systems that need assistance. There was a good discussion on constituents mm -hmm. of emerging concerns, for example, PFOS and PFOA, as well as chromium-6, and whether pri projects that addressed those constituents of, mer of emerging concerns would be prioritized. I believe the answer was uh, yes. Uh, Long-term solution is consolidation of these smaller water systems. That uh, came up as well. Uh, there was some concern expressed uh, by myself about uncommitted uh, funds uh, and not being spent uh, in the fiscal year and then being rolled over to the next. Uh, there was uh, some concern expressed on we should be spending more on OIM expenses and the State Water Board uh, folks, uh, uh, Jasmine, uh, I believe, expressed that uh, they would be making that more of a priority uh, going forward. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I raised that, hey, we're in the third year of the program and, uh, you know, we really need to make progress because there's a lot of systems at need. I think that uh, that sums it up for you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rami. Okay. All right, folks. Okay, so you heard back from the two reporters. Is there anything else that folks would like to add uh, before we take a 45-minute 
break for lunch. Okay, Rami, you summed it up very nicely. So if there aren't any more uh, questions or comments or feedback. We'll hope, go ahead and uh, break, gosh, for 45 minutes, it's 12.53. Sorry, I'm really bad with math. So uh, that would bring us back to, sorry. About 138. 138, yeah. Let's do 140, how's that? Perfect. Let's run it. So folks, thank you so much. I know it's been a long morning. Please take this 45 minutes to hydrate, stretch, eat some good food, and we'll, we'll, re we'll rejoin again in 45 minutes. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Hey, Haiti, whenever you're ready, we can we can okay. work out our, right. our kinks here. How are you All doing? Right. <laughs> uh, good. How are you doing? Good. All right. doing well, um, thank so you. So let's, um, Kristen, if we can have, if we can move, if actually let's add Mark as an interpreter at this time, and then let's have you move over, Mark, and then we're going to test your audio once you're um All Right. And really quick, before we do that, it looks like somebody already put in the chat, one of your team members, uh, the, oh. what you and I had discussed earlier. Uh, if you need another reminder, like at the beginning of the next session, I could just send you a little blurb that you can just mm -hmm. copy and paste back in the chat. Okay. Um, and it's very easy again, so, like. Yeah. So it's that same one that you put in the chat. So just, um, okay. So when we come back, we'll do the same. Okay. Sorry, I just added you, Mark, apologies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's fine. All right. And then also for um, our, OPP staff, those sharing the PowerPoint, if you can start, if Carolyn, hey, please. Your audio is cutting out. Oh, okay. Um, now I can hear you better now. All right, I'm gonna turn off my uh, video. So Carolyn, if you can share your PowerPoint first, um, because I like to get that going and then we'll share the Spanish PowerPoint so that AV can choose the Spanish. Okay, perfect. And now, uh, Lourdes, if you can share yours. Okay, I see that you're sharing. Let me just double check that. That's perfect. All right, um, Kristen, if you would like to hand over the host privileges to me only because I need to do additional tech check uh, with the interpreter, or I, I'm okay if you wanna hang on to it. I just was, if you wanted to go to lunch. Sure, let me, and then I'll make you co-host and then we'll probably switch. Okay. And then um, Lourdes, we're gonna be testing Mark's audio. Um, so if you can confirm um, in a second um, when we do an audio check with him um, that the Spanish webcast that we can hear him there. Um, and then we'll do another another audio check with um, Juan Carlos as well. So, okay, so Kristen has made me host. Thank you, Kristen, enjoy your lunch. Um, all right, so let's go ahead, Mark, and test your um, audio. Thank you, Mark. Um, I know that there's a delay on the webcast, so uh, give us a few moments. But in the meantime, Juan Carlos, if you can go ahead. Yes, I, I do hear you here on Zoom, but we're gonna wait to see if we hear you on the webcast. So. Um, Lourdes, if you can confirm that for us that you hear that you did hear Mark and Juan Carlos. We heard you, Mark. Uh, we're waiting for 
Juan Carlos be to come through, so I know that there's a delay. Okay, we got you both. Thank you. Uh, enjoy your lunch. We will see you back. What was it at 140? Thank you.
Hey, Edie. Hi. All right. It is 140. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get started um, because we still have a lot to cover. But as a reminder, folks, please make sure you select your preferred language by selecting the globe icon at the bottom of your screen or the ellipsis with the three dots on your meeting controls um, and select language interpretation. Click on English or Spanish, select mute original audio or in English mute original audio and make sure you click finish. If someone speaks English, you will automatically hear the interpreter interpret all comments into Spanish. If you need tech support, please let us know through the chat. Or you can also email us at safer at waterboards.ca.gov. We'll be more than happy to support you. Marina? Sure. And now in Spanish, un recordatorio. Por favor, asegúrense de seleccionar su idioma de preferencia. Al seleccionar el icono en forma de un mundo en la parte inferior de su computadora o los tres puntitos en su diapositivo y seleccionar inter interpretación de idiomas. Póngale la palomita en español. Seleccione silenciar audio original. Perdón. Y asegúrese de hacer clic en finalizar o en inglés done. Si alguien habla inglés automáticamente, escuchará el intérprete interpretar al español. Si usted tiene alguna dificultad, por favor, avísenos por el chat y con gusto los apoyaremos. Gracias. Thank you, Marina. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, just checking the chat really quick because I do see something that just came up. Um, all right, so we're good. Uh, we also did include that in the chat in case you missed part of it and you're just joining us, but um, uh, just to select your interpretation channel. All right. So now with that, I would uh, like to introduce Jasmine from the Division of Financial Assistance, um, who will provide an overview of the strategy of domestic wells and state small water systems. Next slide, Jasmine. Thank you, Haiti. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Oaxaca. I'm a supervising engineer over our um, safe and affordable drinking water section in the Division of Financial Assistance. And today I'll be providing an overview of the State Water Board strategy to address issues in communities served by state small water systems or state smalls and domestic wells. Next, please. To help illustrate the need, I wanted to share some re results from the 2022 drinking water needs assessment. The needs assessment included a risk assessment for state smalls and domestic wells, which was designed to identify areas where groundwater is likely to be at high risk of drought and or containing contaminants that exceed safe drinking water standards. Statewide, the top contaminants that showed up in high-risk areas for domestic wells and state smalls included nitrate, arsenic, gross alpha, 1,2,3-trichloropropane, uranium, and hexavalent chromium. So on the left, uh, we see about 93,000 domestic wells statewide were found to be at risk for water quality and about 91,000 were at risk for drought with about 64,000 at risk for both. And then similarly on the right, about 630 state smalls were found to be at risk for water quality and about 320 were at risk for drought with about 380 at risk for both. Next, please. So if you're interested in learning more and playing around with the data, we encourage you to take a look at the map, which is linked here. It's got different layers that you can turn on and off. And uh, also wanted to point out that there are some demographic layers that may be of interest uh, to look at things like pollution burden, population characteristics, race, ethnicity, and population living two times below the federal poverty level. 
as examples. Next, please. And then I also wanted to note that you can explore the water quality and drought risk assessment results separately. Next, please. So as you can see, we do have a very great need statewide. And so some of the ways that the State Water Board Safer Program is working to address these needs is through the following. We have funding available for the countywide and regional programs, which are intended to help address water quality and or water shortage issues through services like well sampling, providing interim water supplies like bottled or hauled water, and also long-term solutions such as consolidation, uh, treatment, and well replacement. We are also promoting as much as possible opportunities for consolidation, especially at the regional scale. And then lastly, there is work being done that could eventually help these communities uh, through the point of use, point of entry pilot, which Chad from our Division of Drinking Water will speak more to in the next segment of the presentation. Next, please. For the countywide and regional programs, this slide shows our existing agreements as well as enrolled households as of the end of July. Um, this is just a snapshot of current enrollment. We have a number of different agreements uh, with self-help enterprises that cover the San Joaquin Valley, uh, a bottled water program in the Central Coast region through Community Water Center, uh, and a statewide well replacement program through Rural Community Assistance Corporation. And then we also have three countywide programs for various services in Tulare, Shasta, and Santa Cruz County, uh, with more in the works currently. Next, please. So now I wanted to move on to talk about a few specific disadvantaged community examples of partnership projects that are being implemented across the state, largely in partnership with our Division of Drinking Water, our Office of Public Participation, uh, as well as our Division of Financial Assistance. Next, please. Um, these are some examples of existing consolidation projects uh, Upper Lake and Lake County, uh, the city of Santa Rosa, city of Stockton, and Apple Avenue in Monterey County. Next, please. These are examples of some larger regional scale consolidation efforts going on right now uh, with the town of Mendocino, Olivehurst Public Utility District in Yuba County, the city of Red Bluff and the Prunedale area in Monterey County. Next, please. And then some other examples of the support for state smalls and domestic wells include uh, projects in the Baldwin Lake area of San Bernardino County um, and O&M funding. Uh, for continued operation of a water kiosk in Inyo County, and a few examples of projects for areas using untreated surface water in Imperial and Lake Counties. Next, please. So that concludes my presentation, and I think we're going to move on to the discussion. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jasmine. So uh, we're going to go ahead and um, open it up for feedback. And so I'm going to present the two questions um, that will guide our discussion. Uh, one, we'd like your feedback on uh, the different approaches for state smalls and domestic wells. And two, uh, we'd like your feedback as to whether there are other approaches we should consider for state smalls um, domestic wells. So as a reminder, please use the raised hand feature uh, if you'd like to provide your feedback. Uh, if you are providing feedback, please, uh, please provide it in no more than three minutes. 
So I will, at this point, I'm going to look at the list of folks and look for raised hands. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands, folks. Okay, let's see who's raised their hand. I've got a question from Jonathan Rash. Jonathan, can you and go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just wanted to to suggest this is maybe a a, a modest uh, proposal, but mm -hmm. you know, if the water board had more presence in throughout the state, in the sense that you have there are places where you can get PA providers and there are places where you can't get PA providers because they're hard to come by. So there's entire regions where it's hard to even know what's out there or what's going on because we don't have a, a local presence and it's hard to even find a PA presence. So if I could make a modest proposal, maybe the water board could, could create a local presence, particularly in these, in these more underserved regions where it's hard to find PAs to you know have you know field offices so that you know there's a local mm, contact a local resource where state smalls and domestic wells might be able to find assistance where you know those those uh, operators those, those individuals are almost certainly not looking at state websites or finding out about you know our program directly you know definitely not the model that exists right now, but maybe it's not a bad model. Thank you, Jonathan. Are there any any additional, any response or feedback on that? Okay. All right, wow, okay, great. We've got some, some hands that are raised. Okay, so we'll go with, uh, with Ethel, uh, Jim, Horacio, and then Sandra. So Ethel, can you please um, close your, your feedback? Um, I just have a question regarding the potential solutions for state smalls and domestic wells on the item uh, well sampling. Is this going to be a monthly requirement starting next year or pretty soon? Okay. Do we have a response from the team? Sure, I'll take this yeah. one. So there, there is no, the jurisdiction, of, just to be clear, the jurisdiction of domestic wells and state small water systems does not fall with the state water board, it falls with the counties. So we don't have the ability to say that there's any sort of requirement around sampling for domestic wells and state smalls, but we, what our countywide and regional program is, which is where we're trying to either fund counties or some other nonprofit to help out, that that program, if if a county wanted to, or if you know a nonprofit in the area wanted to include well sampling in that program, we would be able to fund that the way it's structured now, so that people could come and get their well sampled if they had concerns or outreach could be done to them if we thought that was an area that was problematic. So hopefully that answered your question. If not, happy to provide additional clarification. That answers my question. Thank you. Right. Sure. Thank you so much, Ethel. Okay, we're going to move on to Jim Sullivan. Jim, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, this this is, um, I really see this as a, a, a problem um, that, um, you know, connecting with the state smalls and the private well owners is, is truly a, um, a major task. Um, and it, it really doesn't happen by itself. Um, you know, and I'm finding that engaging, um, a county can, can be pretty, um, um, challenging as well. Um, if, if there's other competing challenges, you, you've got 
you know, a population or, you know, a portion of um, those that are on drinking water that, um, you know, are, are, are basically challenged to begin with. And then trying to get them to be aware of an issue uh, and then engage a county that has competing um, priorities, it, it truly becomes a, um, you know, problem. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I have no idea what the solution is, but um, um, it, it is a challenge for at the state level, for sure, to be able to get down to those different levels, you know, that, that need it. Um, so yeah, I know there's a concern that uh, I guess that's, that's the bottom line for me is there is that concern, but I don't know how to deal with it or, you know, get to that problem. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Does the team have any, any responses or any feedback? Yeah, I would, I mean, I just appreciate the comment. Mm -hmm. We we're working with Jim, so I, I know what he's talking about. It is, it is a challenge for us. There are so many domestic wells in California that we do really need partners. Um, and I, I think that is the hope with these countywide regional programs is to get other, you know, other folks that are a little closer to the ground mm -hmm. engaged and funding so that the counties can do this or, you know, some of their partners if they don't have resources. But yeah, it's, it is definitely um, a place where we'd like more input on how to better do it. So thank you. Great. Thank you, both of you. Okay, so uh, next up is Horacio followed by Sandra. Can you Horacio? hear me? Yes, Horacio, thank you. I'm glad you can join us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finally, I got it in my phone. Um, you know, just just a comment. Um, I think I made it before, but this is the right time. We we need to conduct outreach to all world owners and and um, stay small because. Uh, a lot of them, they may be poisoning themselves or they, they don't know about the programs and the solutions. So we need to coordinate with the county. If the county doesn't want to voluntarily mm -hmm. uh, adopt a program, I think that if the water board has the power, they should mandate counties to to help fix the, the water issues. And if the water board doesn't have uh, the power to do that, then somebody has to go to the legislature and, and make sure that the counties need to be active in, in fixing up this problem that we have for decades. So in order to to fix this uh, problems, we need to invest in long term. And the best way is by doing it with counties that have all that information, they know what the problem is and, and have a team, a team that is dedicated uh, to figure out a way of, of uh, planning and fixing this problem. So I think that's my uh, recommendation for this. Thank you. Thank you, Horacio. Okay, really quickly. Um, we have, up next we have um, Sandra Chavez. Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot that I want to say, <laughs> and it might sound kind of um, pieces or just like I'm saying stuff out loud. So just try to keep up with me as I go along. 
Um, I want to start off by saying that I really appreciate the SAFER program, especially because, you know, we all get to say things and we get to be aware of really how the process is coming along. And yeah, I, I just want to say how thankful I am for you all. Um, and in terms of solutions, I think the question um, that we need to be asking ourselves, yes, we have our, we have our heads screwed on right. Yes, we're focusing on the right things, but we're not focusing on um, communicating with the people who are actually going through these problems. And as a domestic well owner, I will say this, and I have been saying this, won't stop saying that I always have to advocate for myself. And a lot of people aren't even aware that the issue are, is going on. So they don't even have the opportunity to advocate for themselves. So I think that we need to uh, divide and conquer in terms of educating people. Um, I'm sure there's already groups that do that. But for me, I would say, let's say the GSA is responsible for giving me uh, bottled water. But I didn't know that GSA was responsible for that. I had no terms of communication with the GSA, if it wasn't for Community Water Center, if it wasn't for Community Water Center, I wouldn't be aware of these opportunities, even of the opportunity to speak with the SAFER program. So I think what needs to be done, we need to come up with a group that actually listens to what's going on in these smaller regions, in these smaller communities. Um, community Water Center and all of these other recipients of funding have been doing a great job, but I think we need to focus on where are the gaps in terms of communication. I think it would be a great thing as well to add um, in the GSA or in management zones, just places where decisions are being made, where decision, like places that are responsible for decisions made for these recipients and domestic well communities, I think they need to take into account uh, just like the What's, what's the word, the experiences. Like if more people who had, who go through this and we listen to them, I think we could, we could fix a lot of these solutions, but we need to start small and we need to know where's the gap. Um, yeah, I feel like, again, we are going through the, the right things, the right processes, thinking about the same things, but we're forgetting about what, what really we need to be doing. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And I believe uh, Kristen uh, had some, a comment to make. Kristen? Thanks, Marina. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to um, provide a little bit of background and context around some of the challenges that the State Water Board faces in really being effective in, in reaching out to these communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Prior to SB 200, the State Water Board was not required to collect or manage any data or information about domestic wells or state small water systems. When Senate Bill 200 was passed a few years ago and created the SAFER program, it did require for the first time ever that counties submit to the Water Board a uh, data information on their domestic wells and their state smalls. In particular, they're required to send us their locational information, if they have any contact information. And then uh, if a water quality sample is taken and sent to the county, that water quality sample needs to come to the state water board. So we've been working with uh, counties for the last few years to try to help them comply with these new requirements in SB 200. Um, in the 2022 needs assessment report that we released earlier this year, we do include a breakdown of which counties have um, somewhat complied with those reporting requirements. Um, we do have a lot of good data and information that the counties have submitted on state small water systems. It's not perfect, but it's a good starting place. And that really helps us with doing our outreach and communication efforts to those systems. The domestic well data though is really uh, incomplete. We only had five counties submit some domestic well information to us, um, five out of over 50. 
um, and only 50 some thousand wells, which is very, very low. Um, we know mm -hmm. that there are, um, we have over 350,000 uh, well completion reports at DWR for domestic wells, but our estimates could go up to 700 to 800,000 domestic wells that are out there, but we don't know where they're located. We don't have contact information. We don't know if they're being used. Um, and that uh, is really difficult. If, if counties don't have that data digitized to share with us, and then we don't have it, um, it makes it hard for folks to be uh, effective in our outreach strategies. You can't just send out a mailer because we don't know where to mail a letter um, mm -hmm. and we don't know where to send people. And so I just wanted to put that out there. We are struggling um, to, to get that location information and wanted you guys to um, at least be aware of that effort because I don't think we did a good job emphasizing that here. So I'm happy to answer questions about it. Thanks so much, Kristen. Okay, next up, we have a um, next hand that was up is uh, Isabel. Isabel, you can provide your comment now. Sí, claro. Um, eh, una de las, escuchando todos los comentarios, um, sí es preocupante <laughs> eh, dejar en las manos del condado decisiones uh, de esta magnitud, porque um, Muchas de las mayoría de veces hay intereses propios y es el problema más serio. Uh, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo vamos a resolver eso? Eh, si las decisiones se dejan en un condado que no está haciendo el trabajo y además hay el interés propio, ¿cómo lo vamos a manejar? Eh, se tiene que llegar a, a, ok, viene a la mesa estatal eh, o se va directo al Estado. O sea, ¿qué es la decisión que se va a hacer? Porque es serio esta situación. Otra de mis sugerencias sería estos representantes de condados, traerlos a estas juntas para que ellos respondan. Porque es muy práctico representar, pero no actuar cuando se hay intereses personales. Gracias. Thank you, Isabel. Are there any, any comments from the team and the staff that's participating? Yeah, I think I would just say, you know, our outreach and work with counties, um, a lot of them struggle with um, staffing and capacity issues too. Some of them have some old records on wells, but they're on paper and they don't have anyone who can digitize them, put them, you know, on a computer. And, you know, as much as they'd like to be able to do that, they, they struggle because they don't have the resources. Um, counties are not required to digitize this information. Their counties are also not required to do water quality testing for domestic wells. Um, there's a lot of things that are kind of missing on the regulatory side um, that would make a county do something. And that's something that the state water board can't do. I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to chime in on, on that piece. It, they are our partners and we need to work with them and try to figure out how we can support them the best we can. Kristen, I just, I guess I had a follow up and this may have been what Sandra, I saw Sandra raise her hand after you spoke last time. You know, if there's, if there is a way that you all think that we can um, outreach better to domestic well owners or state smalls, if they're, you know, radio or you know different mechanisms to get out you know to have outreach i think we would really appreciate mm -hmm. hearing from you on that so thanks puedo agregar algo más sí cómo no yes go ahead sí sí yes okay all right so supongo que en mi opinión, 
dándole forma a esto. Cuando una persona, un residente o un este, agricultor va a hacer un pozo, se le tiene que pedir un permiso al condado. Si este condado está haciendo su trabajo bien, debería de tener ese récord. En, y a lo que voy, ok, entonces, ¿quién va a controlar a quién? Vamos a estar discutiendo aquí el, los problemas y no vamos a las soluciones. Porque para hacer un pozo tienes que tener un permiso y el permiso lo da el condado. Entonces el condado tiene el récord. Y si la mesa estatal le pide al condado el récord, va a tener acceso a esos documentos. Me imagino. Gracias. Thank you, Isabel. So can I, can I chime in um, here because I'm, I'm a, work, a county employee and my division is responsible for issuing well permits. Absolutely, and, Jim. Go ahead. Okay. So, I mean, but one thing I can tell you is that with 58 counties, we all have 58 ways to do things. So... For us, we do have a well bulletin, California well bulletins, that is for construction standard. However, in that construction standards, there's no requirement for, for testing. So it really depends on individual county to see whether they require a testing before the well can be final. So some counties require total coliform to be tested. Some counties require total coliform and nitrate to be tested before the well can be final. But it depends which county you're talking about. And also, you know, some of the wells that we see in the county, they are so old, you know, we, there's no permitting or there's no permit records. So I think we are dealing with multiple layers of uh, problems or issues over here. Thank you for so, chiming in. Yeah, one thing I just want to finish up is that that's why perhaps the testing testing program is probably important because that's one way we can do a really comprehensive survey or, or comprehensive study to find out what are the wells they are giving out poor quality. Uh, uh, water. Thank you for providing that, that additional information. Any other uh, comments on this particular um, topic? Okay. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Mario Lisa. And I know there's other folks uh, that are queued up. So um, uh, thank you for your patience. We'll, we'll get to you. We have Maria Lisa uh, next, followed by Jim, followed by Sandra. So Maria Lisa, please provide your feedback. Sí. Ok. Uh, lo que yo quisiera es que se haga más alcance comunitario, en el sentido en el que ya lo pedí en el pasado, ¿verdad? Y si vino la persona a, a la comunidad, pero la comunidad es extensa. Yo entiendo que ustedes hacen un trabajo muy, muy exhaustivo, muy grande, pero me gustaría que si vienen más a la comunidad y se integran más a la comunidad lo que está pasando, porque realmente la comunidad no puede seguir nada más viviendo de cierta agua y enfermándose con el agua que está contaminada. Ah, como decía mi compañera, ah, hay rancheros, y eso lo oí aquí cerquita donde vivo. Yo vivo en el noreste de Baicelia. En Seville hay un ranchero que no sé quién le daría el permiso, pero siembra, tala, siembra y la fruta la exportan. Ni siquiera es para consumo local. En ese caso, me gustaría que si se hace alcance comunitario, ustedes, que son las autoridades, vengan más cerquita a la comunidad Y eduquen, como dijo Sandra también, eduquen a la comunidad qué es lo que realmente está pasando. Den la confianza a la comunidad de lo que está pasando. 
porque no, no nos podemos echar años tras años ustedes entregando dinero y no se arreglan los problemas. Esto no debe de seguir pasando ni nosotros seguir abogando y nadando contra corriente sin una solución. Y ese es mi aporte por hoy. Thank you, Mario Lisa. Any comments from the team? All right, so we have uh, we we have two more, actually three questions uh, queued up. However, we would like to wrap these up pretty quickly so we can move ahead and take a break. Um, so our next uh, question or commenter comes from uh, Jim Sullivan. Jim, are you still interested in making a comment? I don't see your hand up anymore, but still wanted to yeah. ask. Okay. Yeah. yeah just, Thank you. Just real, just real quick. Sure. As we're talking about this some more, I, you know, I, I see that, you know, we have in Safer a lot of money um, dedicated to technical assistance. Possibly could could that type of a, um, a task also extend down to um, private well, uh, small system, um, smalls. Um, kind of an outreach um, position, especially in some of those targeted counties that might not be complying with um, uh, some of the the uh, required um, SB 200 requirements and um, possibly be more effective getting into the communities that might be uh, at risk or, you know, potentially um, targets for, you know, uh, contaminated water. Just a thought. Okay, to our team, do we have any, any comments or responses to Jim's um, feedback? Jim, I wasn't okay. able to hear what you said in the beginning, there was some sort of Spanish interpret. I was getting Spanish. So is it, could you, is it possible you could repeat your question? Oh, sure. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Yeah, just, just the, the, um, the amount of money that is um, um, tagged for technical assistance uh, for safer, would, would it be possible to, to allocate a portion of that for um, possibly outreach, um, professionals to or, or local folks that could get into the communities um, and uh, provide that awareness and um, um, you know um, to those areas that could potentially be uh, at risk for uh, groundwater contamination and you know provide awareness um, and maybe the resources uh, the pathways to get wells tested and uh, those type of activities that maybe dream uh, that that are required by SB 200 in some of the counties that might not be complying with those kind of uh, requirements. Great, thank you. I appreciate you repeating it. Marina, I know you guys mm -hmm. have a program where you are starting to develop relationships and possible assistance in that area. I don't know if you wanna take the question. Yeah, we're actually working on a, a developing an outreach and engagement strategy that where we'll be working with communities just to better, uh, better actually address that issue in terms of providing uh, additional support at the local level in terms of outreach, technical assistance, and whatnot. So that's something you'll be hearing a little bit more about. Um, but that is actually something that is already in the works. So in the very uh, in the coming months, you'll be hearing some uh, some more about this. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so in terms of um, our next uh, speakers, we have um, we have Sandra and then Esther, and then we're going to have to take a break from at that point. So, uh, Sandra, do you did you have another question? Yes. So, let, let me see. Where, where do I start here? So. Earlier, um, it was mentioned that prior to SB 200, we didn't have the attention on water like we do now statewide. Um, and 
SB 200 has done a lot for us. And I'm wondering, is there a way that we could do something similar to SB 200, but with our focus geared towards uh, county funding, staffing, and just uh, outreach programs within the county? So now we, we've gotten it to like a state awareness type of deal. How can we focus on an awareness within the counties to just divide the problem into smaller sections making it easier for us to get to the to a long-term solution. Um, also, another question that I had was, so we, we're having a lack of regional information about zonings, where the wells are. Um, is there a way that we could come up kind of with like a water system in place made for domestic wells? Maybe that's already something kind of being made or in the process. Um, I was also thinking maybe we could use like Google Maps to see, okay, this section of land, are they being, um, how, where are they getting their water from? A public water system or a domestic well? Maybe we could even work with the GSAs who also have information, at least enough information to be able to, for, for me personally, for our well, they have enough information to see how much water I'm pumping and how much to charge me. So I think they have enough resources to see like, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like what the GSA is doing, maybe it could work in with the counties, something. I think we need to have some sort of water system specifically made for domestic wells to represent domestic well owners. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Any comments or feedback from the team? Uh, the only thing I'd say is thank you for your comments. I also, we do have some maps in place where we're already trying to do a little of that work. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat. We have mm -hmm. where we have an outreach tool, um, but it's also, we are taking some of that and doing some overlays to try and find places in statewide where, where we would do the kind of outreach that Marina and mm -hmm. Jim were talking about earlier, like where's the worst water quality and where are they disadvantaged and mm -hmm. um so we are we are doing mm -hmm. some of that already but i really love the idea of getting uh counties more involved in sort of breaking it down so thank right. you i'll put that in the chat too the yeah. link thank you michelle okay uh and last we're gonna the last question we'll take is esther esther did you want to provide your feedback Ay, muchas gracias. Uh -huh. eh, mi comentario en este punto es acerca eh, de los pueblos pequeños. Eh, yo estoy rodeada de ellos. Estoy aquí en el condado de Fresno. Eh, ¿Qué va a pasar con ellos en el caso que se les termine su agua? Eh, ellos están rodeados de grandes campos de pistache y de almendra. Ellos siguen usando el agua para su agricultura. Y ellos están en mucho riesgo de quedarse sin agua. Muchos de ellos, los niveles de agua de sus pozos han bajado y solamente, por ejemplo, están usando uno. ¿Qué va a pasar si les, se les termina el agua? ¿De qué forma eh, la mesa les va a poder ayudar? Otra de mis preguntas es acerca de los pozos domésticos. Eh, ellos están, muchas familias que se les ha secado, están esperando una beca eh, ya por tiempo. No han tenido respuesta acerca de esto. Si alguien me puede ayudar. Gracias. Okay, folks. Any additional, any comments for Esther or feedback? Megan? Um, I can give a little bit. So mm -hmm. as far as um, public water systems, we do have funding programs in place that can help respond if their wells go dry. We can provide, you know, interim hauled and bottled water. We can also potentially help with repairs that might enable them to continue using the well, like dropping the pump down to a deeper depth, or if that's not an option, you know, potentially installing an emergency well for them as well. Um, so we do have kind of the ability to directly fund public water systems for those types of purposes. 
Um, when it comes to state smalls and domestic wells, again, we really don't have a mechanism to provide funding directly to those types of like individual homeowners. Um, but you know, th if the county is covered by a countywide or regional program, then mm -hmm. there are resources in place to respond similarly. Great. Thank you, Megan. And I'd like to take just a, a minute to, to elaborate a little bit more on the outreach and engagement strategy. Just because I know there's, I've seen, I know that there's been a lot of interest in that. And I guess we'll hear more about it, but it's uh, just really quickly, um, you know, we have a strategy that we've developed to be, be able to advance the, um, the justice and address the challenges that uh, for meaningful engagement. And so the SAFER program will plans to partner uh, and fund community experts to conduct local outreach and engagement activities that can achieve the following uh, outcomes. Basically increase early uh, community engagement to, with, the safe, with the SAFER program in order to ensure uh, community buy-in keeping local drinking water projects on track, identifying potential issues, uh, risk and delays and whatnot, also to build local capacity within the community and to create a path forward uh, towards equitable and resilient water governance. So in terms of the folks who are, in, who are involved as part of the strategy, uh, it, it includes three types of outreach and engagement partners. One are funding partners uh, that can enter into, enter into funding agreements with the state water board and fund uh, community partners for funding and outreach engagements. Uh, these funding partners would serve as liaisons between the state water boards uh, and community partners that help address the barriers uh, to funding outreach. Second are community partners uh, that would receive funding from funding partners for outreach and engagement uh, activities in communities with drinking water challenges. Uh, and then lastly, technical assistance providers. Uh, which basically have the funding agreements with the state water board to provide the administrative, technical, uh, operational, legal manager and whatnot, um, and community engagement support to support uh, failing water systems. So just wanted to give you that quick, just a, a quick, uh, quick details on that, on that particular strategy, just to let you know that we are actually, have been thinking about it and we've, we've developed something and that uh, you will be sharing some details um, uh, very soon. So thanks. All right, um, I think at this point, we're gonna go ahead and uh, take a quick uh, five minute break. Uh, so um, I guess next slide. Okay, so if we can be back, I'm gonna just say at 2.35, let's just round it up, okay? Thanks folks, we'll be back, uh, see you back at 2.35.
I got back just in time for a break, huh, Marina? Yes, you did. <laughs> How long is the break until? Uh, one more minute. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, folks, I hope that five minute break helped you because I, it definitely did help me. So, um, <laughs> so welcome back everyone. Uh, so now I uh, would like next, the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Chad Fisher from the Division of Drinking Water who will provide an overview of the point of use and point of entry report. A question and answer period will be moderated by Marina at the end of his presentation. Chat. Great. Can I just, so can somebody tell me they can hear and see me? Yes, we can hear <laughs> yeah. you. I can see Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Chad Fisher. I work in DDW Safer. I, physically, I work in the DDW Fresno field office and um, about a year ago, I joined Safer to start a new unit focused on rural solutions. And part of that effort is developing this point of use and point of entry report that I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about. Um, I, know, I know many of you, but um, those who I don't, nice to meet you, um, as this is my first time presenting here at the advisory group. Um, I said that I joined Safer about a year ago. I'm not new to drinking water or to DDW though. I've been working it's coming up on 15 years in, uh, in Division of Drinking Water in the Fresno Field Office, working with um, all sorts of communities, um, all sorts of fantastic communities here in the Central Valley. And um, I'm born and raised here in the Central Valley. And so um, happy to be kind of servicing those communities and, and working with folks here. So um, with that, we'll get into uh, my my talk here about this report. So next slide, please. All right, thank you. Um, so like I said, one of the endeavors that this new unit is taking on is developing this point of use and point of entry report. Um, and, you know, there's at least three things that this report is trying to do. And I kind of put it in these three buckets that are these bullets here. Um, on this slide. And so the first one is really to try to, to try to bring together what we collectively, DDW, DFA, water industry communities know about point of use and point of entry and really focusing on, you know, what are the successes and what are the obstacles um, to success? Um, and then um, if we're thinking about those obstacles and those successes, you know, how can we draw conclusions and make recommendations to say like, hey, here's the things that, that really are meaningful as we're talking about point of use and point of entry. And then, you know, also like, what are these barriers and, and kind of how can we overcome them? And that's what the third bullet here is, is about is identifying pilot studies that, you know, can can help bring information and clarity around some of those, those barriers and how to overcome them and you know, thus lean towards more success for point of use and point of entry application. So next slide, please. So this next slide, um, just to level set a little bit, when I say point of use and point of entry, I want to make sure everybody is on the same page. I may slip and say POU and POE, but I'm trying to use point of use and point of entry. So, um, you know, those are just abbreviations. But so point of use, um, you know, it's a small treatment plant, um, you know, usually under the sink of, um, under the kitchen sink in somebody's home. And there's a separate spigot that comes up next to the kitchen sink and there's treated water, you know, going, going through this small treatment plant and then, you know, available for, you know, safe drinking water through this separate spigot. So a single access point for safe drinking water within the home. There on the left, that's what a, the, um, that little pictogram is, is, trying to, uh, is trying to show. And then point of entry, 
So this is a, a little bit bigger treatment plant and it's usually installed you know, in the garage or outside of the home. And um, it's treating all of the water that goes into the home. And so there isn't you know, a separate spigot at the kitchen sink, all of the water coming in is being treated. So not to belabor the point, but kitchen sink, bathroom sinks, shower, even toilets, all of the water that, that is accessed there in the home. It does not treat water that you know is used for irrigation to water the grass or plants or whatnot. So an outside hose or whatnot, it is going to be receiving treated water. So, um, you know, I should also mention here that that as we talk about point of use and point of entry, this is really kind of a small segment if we're thinking about drinking water solutions, and it's usually deployed in a you know best deployed in communities where consolidation is not an option where finding a new safe drinking water source like drilling a new well is not an option. And then even we get down to that centralized treatment of a contaminated source, you know, and thus that centralized treatment would provide safe drinking water, but that also isn't a good option. And so these point of use and point of entry applications, um, I think of them on kind of a continuum of solutions all the way to one side that that these are what we can deploy when there's not really a better answer. And 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 in the report, it 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 does try to draw that out that we're talking about this specific segment because point of use and point of entry, you know, is a less less robust drinking water solution than what I've talked about before, the consolidation, the new source, the centralized treatment. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in the report, what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at where is point of use and point of entry being used right now, and it's being used in, or um, it's either permitted or proposed in 122 public water systems. And here on the right, the map shows, you know, with the dots where they are geographically and the table provides the same information, but just there in a table rather than a map. So we can see the types of water systems where point of use and point of entry is being deployed. And then, like I said, where, where it's being deployed. Um, so to jump out for me or, or stick out a little bit for me is that, you know, if we think about these 122, um, you know, about a quarter, about a quarter of them are deployed in communities and then about half in non-transient non-communities. Um, just as a reminder, non-transient non-communities, um, examples of those types of water systems are businesses and schools. Um, there's others, but those are great examples. And then, uh, and then transient, you know, the kind of the, the, uh, the other quarter, another quarter of the, um, of the systems where we see it being deployed. And again, a reminder, a transient water system, a good, uh, uh, a good example there is a rest stop on a highway or some parks. You know, the transient population means that the same folks are not typically going there day after day after day. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. So the report, we want to consider equity. And so we we can think about this, or we we tried to think about this in a few different ways, and we figured out at least three, and I'm gonna talk about them now. The first one is that, and and these are, I should say, these are the 122 water systems that we talked about on the previous slide. These are the same dots, but trying to take equity into consideration. And so this map shows the Cal Enviro screen score. A few things to note here is that lighter color is worse and darker color is is better in this case and then let me remind folks um, that the cal virus screen score what it does is it tries to take two different metrics and then it multiplies them together and comes up with a score and this is chad explaining it but for me what it says is that it's trying to take the total pollution burden you know how much uh, how much air pollution does the community experience? How much uh, how much drinking water contamination is there? So, kind of, what is the uh, what is the contam the total contamination or pollution in the community on one side, and then on the other side is what's the community's exposure or potential exposure or their risk around that um, around that pollution? And um, 
things that things that are included there are poverty um, uh, and maybe access to health access to healthcare is another good example. So then you take those and you multiply them together and you get this Callan virus screen score. So um, a lot of light colored dots here and you know, so it shows us that POU and POE is being deployed in communities that, you know, have a high Cal virus screen source. So definitely do have some risk, you know, some environmental risk around, you know, certainly in drinking water. That's why they're being deployed and, and maybe elsewise. So next slide, please. Great. So um the the other two equity considerations and they were listed on the previous slide but is we wanted to try to touch on or think about majority race and the disadvantaged status of communities again we're talking about these 122 water systems where pou is being deployed right now um because we have you know we know we know those because they're public water systems there's a permitting process and, and so we know where those are and so we can develop some information about these so majority race here on the left what we see is you know about 60 percent of the communities where point of use and point of entry is being deployed are hispanic communities and then 37 percent white and then i'm just reading what it says but um and then a small percentage of no data, and then a small percentage of uh, majority Asian communities. And then on the other side, disadvantaged status. You know, what this shows um, surprised me a little bit, so I think it's worth unpacking, which is about half of those communities are disadvantaged or severely disadvantaged. Um, there's a little bit of no data there, but if we look at it kind of qualitatively, that's what we see about half disadvantaged and, and severely disadvantaged, which means, you know, half not disadvantaged. Um, for me, what this says or, or an explanation around that is that um, in both communities that are disadvantaged and non disadvantaged, if the community is small enough, you know, kind of no matter how wealthy the community might be, there oftentimes just isn't the economies of scale to support another solution you know kind of primarily centralized treatment because we would go after the consolidation of the new sources available so the next slide great um domestic well so um here on the right this um you know just shows a map of of the risk around of the water quality risk around pardon me, around domestic wells. And in this case, the darker colors, the purples and blues are, are worse. And then the lighter colors are lower risk. Um, and then let's move to the table here. And really what I, fo what I end up focusing on is just that what this table says is that there's tens of thousands of, um, tens of thousands of domestic wells that, that are in need that point of use and point of entry may be a solution for. Um, something that we should talk about here is that domestic wells, we've switched gears a little bit to talk about domestic wells. We previously were talking about public water systems and they're different, there's a different paradigm. In, in public water systems, there is a regulatory framework that is required because there is Safe Drinking Water Act and um, point of use and point of entry are being deployed uh, to achieve compliance with drinking water regulations. But with domestic wells, those same regulations don't exist. And so there is not a framework for how you, how you really kind of deploy these and, and what is required as far as operations and maintenance and sampling and, and even the requirements on the devices. There isn't a prescription there. Um, and so it is really, you know, it's really different. And then, you know, um, like, you know, like the discussion previously, you know, just in the last section about, you know, thinking about state smalls and domestic wells, a lot of these, um, these themes came up is that there isn't some framework, at least yet, around domestic wells. Um, the last bullet here, I, I want to talk about because we, all, you know, y'all already talked about this in the last section, which is that counties or groups of counties need are a are a key part in this sort of solution, right? We need to rely on counties or groups of counties to, to be a part of or lead the implementation um, of 
of solutions for domestic wells, which point of use and entry could be. So next slide. Great, so um, the next two slides are about water quality. I'm a water quality guy, so I like these. But um, so this plot here, what it shows, and it may be a little small, apologies, but are all the counties in the state there on the horizontal axis? Um, and then on the vertical axis is, is the concentration of nitrate. And it's the highest concentration of nitrate in those counties. Um, the lighter colored bars are the highest concentrations for domestic wells, and then the darker colored bars are the, are the highest concentration for, um, for municipals, so for public water systems. You know, um, with that explanation, really what jumps out for me is one is that, you know, half or more of the count, well, I should say, sorry, um, let me back up. The red horizontal line is the maximum contaminant level for nitrate of 10. So above that is unsafe. So half of the counties have some places in the counties that have nitrate, you know, over the maximum contaminant level. That, that's a lot for me. And then the magnitude of the bars, how tall they are, that strikes me also is that, you know, a lot of the contempt, there's a lot of contamination that isn't just, you know, a bit over the MCL and, um, you know, a lot of it is, is way over, which, which complicates treatment really is from my perspective, it's like, okay, that may be a, a maybe a little bit, of, it's a different challenge to treat nitrate at 12 than it is to treat nitrate at 50 or 100. So some challenges there, definitely. All right, the next slide um, is a little more simple. And um, what we see is just the contaminants that we deal with here in California. And in these point of use and point of entry applications, we, we need to be able to deal with, with, with everything that we, um, that we, you know, that we encounter here in California. And so it's the, um, you guys have, y'all probably, you know, have seen, uh, infographics like this before. So nitrate, nitrate, arsenic, TCP, gross alpha, uranium, hexchrome. Um, one thing that isn't here, but I should mention is that, you know, increasingly we're seeing multiple contaminants at a single site. So even if we're talking about a domestic well, you know, that could have a, a point of use or a point of entry solution, we might need a solution for nitrate and TCP or uranium and ur uranium and arsenic or something. So again, just, uh, it's, you know, it just gets more complicated, the higher the levels and the more contaminants we're talking about. Next slide, please. We did outreach to prepare this report. We did four different um, outreach sessions. Um, I think I'm going a little long, so I'm gonna try to hurry up a little bit. Um, the primary, the question that we asked to these four different groups centered around this top statement, what are the limitations or obstacles for POU or POE success? Um, and so we did these four outreach sessions to these four, and we did four different outreach sessions and tried to focus on different groups with different kind of lenses and different expertise. So we really could get some, some good insights. Um, the first one was practitioners and technical assistants. This included, you know, engineering firms, NGOs, folks that are actually, you know, implementing these solutions and overseeing installation of these, um, of these devices local government um, then the third one was our environmental justice partners and the fourth one was water industry focusing on certifiers and manufacturers because for the water industry that's a lot of where the gaps where we were uncovering where the gaps for success really really are from a technical perspective um, i should say that that some some of our some of our partners um, attended multiple, you know, because they wear different hats and have multiple different perspectives. And so really appreciated that. And some of our participants provided case studies and um, kind of after conversations, after dialogue, which was really, um, it was just really nice to connect and hear more in depth. All right, the next slide. 
Okay, so I think we have just a couple um, a couple of slides left. So the highlights of our recommendations, and we group them. You know, we tried to group them in into these different groups. The first one being equity. Um, the second bullet here, um, well, actually both. So um, we need to. Um, you know the great we need greater awareness and and really monitoring if we're gonna if the pou and poe is going to be equitable and so i'm stumbling on our words here but but really we need to continue asking the question are is point of use and point of entry being deployed disproportionately in communities of color and in disadvantaged communities and so we want to kind of continually ask that question and i think we're centering on a couple different ways to do that Kind of in a kind of in a case by case, like in a in a every single case kind of scenario, um, some sort of criteria, and then also thinking, you know, uh, every year maybe to look at um, maybe to uh, to look at all of the communities that um, that are using point of use and point of entry, and to try to aggregate um, some of the metrics that I previously talked about and other metrics which um which is part of the discussion question so i'm looking forward to that um and then the other piece is that poe poe since it treats you know all of the water going into the home it's a more robust solution you know there's more water available kind of continuous water available and then also just you know it's just if we're talking about equity right it's a single access point, you know, next to your kitchen sink is a lot different than all of the water coming into your home being safe, right? Um, awareness and education, we need to make informational materials um, available in the languages that folks are comfortable, you know, using, reading, speaking. Um, and we need to make that, we need to make that information available to the end user. So to the domestic well owner or to the resident. Um, and then also to our partners, we need to kind of make this information more ubiquitous. Um, outreach, um, we need to, what we found around kind of, it, it centered, the outreach part for me, what resonates here is what we heard over and over in our outreach sessions was, individual and community trust of the people that are coming into their community and deploying the solution and then also the trust of the actual device itself that was kind of the whole ball game it's like if you don't have that like you're never going to get anywhere and this resonates for me just in my work with um with small water systems working with people you know in small water systems it makes all all the sense to me so um we can do some things around that um the education piece is 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 a big piece and you know learning how to connect with people how they want to be connected with right um it's in the next slide this operator educational cohort um and workforce development so i'll save it till next slide actually can we go back to the back to the previous slide i'm sorry yeah great <laughs> um i'm almost finished here Technical, this centers around that uh, not all the, we don't have devices that are certified for removal of all the contaminants we need them to be certified for. And so examples are high levels of nitrate, since we looked at that plot before, you know, if it's over 25 or so, we don't have kind of an off the shelf reliable solution. They're being developed, but they're not there yet. Likewise, TCP, we don't have an off the shelf solution that is certified to, to remove TCP. We have devices that should work, but should work isn't good enough, right? We need the certification around it that says that it does work. Um, there is, a, there is in particularly in, in domestic wells, there's also bacteriological contamination that um, kind of the, the standard devices right now don't don't address it all they make an assumption that there isn't bacteriological contamination and so that's something that we need to lean into is is figuring out how we can you know pair different technologies together um, to ensure that the, any bacteriological contamination that exists is mitigated um, and then legislative and regulatory this is about streamlining some regulatory processes so that we can deploy pou or point of use and point of entry devices more quickly right that um the provision of safe 
uh, of an alternative for safe water to folks who are who are on board and want and need that we we want that to be quicker so now next slide great um this probably is going to be reviewed because i've probably touched on most all of it the education and the strategy and materials is again about providing um, information to people in the language the languages that they're comfortable with in a way that they're comfortable with and meeting them where where and how they want to digest that information. Um, performance certification I talked about is that we need devices that are certified off the shelf to remove, um, you know, we need an alternative for all contaminants, right? Um, bacteriological contamination I just touched on. Um, the pilot study here is, um, I shouldn't be rushing through these so much, but these are the pilot studies that, that, the, um, that this draft report you know, suggests. And so then I'll go back to the bacteriological contamination <clears throat> is that I, I said before that we do experience bacteriological contamination in domestic wells up to a third of the domestic wells in California. So we need a solution around this. And so this pilot study is to explore and demonstrate that, that some solutions are out there and that work and can be deployed on you know, on a point of use or point of uh, point of entry scale, right? We need to just be able to to install those and know that they'll work. Smart devices. Um, this is about a a cellular or Wi-Fi connection, you know, from the device made available to the homeowner, but then also made available to a service provider that is in charge of the operations and maintenance, so that. You know they can that both parties all parties can know in real time how that device is actually performing it'll increase confidence and trust and it'll ensure that you know when the device needs to be <clears throat> needs to be serviced it's service but when it's not there isn't some intrusion into the person's house because that's a big deal um operator certification um this is uh, this is about um and this is what i touched on before this is about that we found that there's kind of two different sides that, that will dictate success and you need both of them. The first one is the technical side. You need somebody that can, in, that knows the technology, knows the devices, can install the devices, knows what the sampling is, all of kind of the technical, does it, you know, install it right, ensure that it works right. That's kind of the technical side. And then more important for me and more important from what we heard from all of our outreach sessions is a kind of a community connection engagement component, that trust coming back is that we need folks in the communities that are, you know, deploying these devices to be able to connect with folks because if they can't connect with folks, they can't establish that trust. And what we heard over and over is without that, like it's just gonna, it's just gonna, you know, either not work initially or, or fall apart shortly thereafter. And then point of use and point of entry is, uh, we talked a little bit about point of entry being, you know, a more robust solution, right? There's, you know, it's a little, it's a, it's a little bit bigger treatment plant and then all of the water coming into the house is treated. We wanna do some um, kind of a pros and cons of point of use and point of entry in certain scenarios. And the bullet talks about it, the ease of installation, what do residents think about it? How easy is it to operate and maintain? There's access issues, right? Like the point of use device requires somebody to come into your house and get under your sink. Um, the point of entry could be, you know, on the side of the garage or in your garage or on the side of the house somewhere where it's less, you know, it's less intrusive there. And the next slide. Um, these can, uh, this is duplicative. So um, I've already talked about these things. I'll let folks read through there. Um, let me talk about just two of them and then we'll move on to our discussion questions. The, the one that I wanted to talk about a little bit is the second bullet. Um, well, it's, it's actually kind of laced through here, but that we want to under, we want to just recognize that we're shifting the responsibility when we're talking about point of use or point of entry. And this is certainly true at domestic wells, but also true in public water systems is that we've shifted the responsibility from the water system um, or an entity, some sort of governance entity. And we shifted much or all of that responsibility down to the resident, to the individual. And so we need to take that into account. And so if we're thinking about deploying these, 
like at a domestic well scale, we also need to be thinking about how do we support that resident? And maybe that's a, maybe that's creating some structure around ongoing operations, maintenance and sampling. It's certainly at least education. And so um, that rings through to a lot of these conclusions is that shift in responsibility, um, which is, again, comes from a lot of our outreach sessions and just is one of the themes of this report. Um, we can switch, we can go on to the next slide, which I think are our discussion questions. And mm -hmm. I think this is where Marina is going to take it away. And yeah. Leave her so thank you. Yeah, I'll let you take a, a deep breath there. That was a lot. That's a lot of really cool information. So thank you for sharing. Oh, that's that's a lot. Uh, it's exciting stuff. Okay, so we're going to dedicate this next portion to um, have folks uh, provide feedback on the discussion questions, which I'll read out. Uh, what strategies should local agencies use for outreach and education efforts? For the workforce development pilot study, what is the best strategy to recruit people who are not involved in the water sector? Third question, based on the pilot studies proposed on slide 49, do you have any suggestions for additional efforts? And the last question for point of use, point of entry solutions, what equity tracking metrics um, should be prioritized? So again, if you don't have your, your meeting material packets, uh, please use that. You can refer to some of the information that's there. Um, so if folks uh, would like to provide feedback uh, on these, on the POU, POE uh, report presentation that Chad just presented, please use the raise hand feature to raise your hand and I will uh, call on you accordingly. Okay, we've got one raised hand and that's from Jinmin. Go ahead. Uh, I just have a simple question. Is POE considered as a permanent solution? That's a, uh, <laughs> that is a really, really good question, which is, yeah, you can think of point of use or point of entry as anything from a temporary solution, which is, which is typically the paradigm we think about it mm -hmm. in a public water system. But as communities get smaller and more rural and other solutions, you know, drop away from, you know, being realistic, we may need to think about these as longer or long-term solutions, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, I think in those cases that's, and, and a lot of this report is about that this point of use and point of entry is not perfect, but in a scenario where it's that or, you know, a worse outcome, of, you know, exposure to contaminated water, like, the, let's help, let's make it, let's make it as good as it can be. Great. Jamin, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, uh, next hand up is Jim Sullivan. Jim? Sure. Well, um, I know that, um, you know, working um, for a state agency in the Midwest um, and in the drinking water program back in Indiana, this, this truly is kind of the last, um, uh, last solution that you really wanna to go to. And, and it truly is when there's no other good answers, um, point of use, point of entry. Um, so it really gets down to operation and maintenance and um, for, for a homeowner to be doing their maintenance um, for point of use or point of entry, it, it gets down to you know, that uh, diligence that a homeowner would have to do to know that they would have to be maintaining that system. And you know, if, if they, um, and, and you all know, this, I know at the state that if it's not maintained correctly, you know, there's potential that, um, you know, after the, um, the, whatever the solution is for the point of use point entry, if that medium or, or uh, uh, filter is not, um, you know, maintained correctly, you could 
you know, uh, have run the potential of having the water worse than, than the source water already is. So I think it gets right back to kind of the, the outreach um, and um, the, the, the counties, um, you know, it's probably gonna go down to that level, um, having the responsibility to kind of um, monitor, you know, these systems that um, are in place and, you know, assist homeowners and small systems um, on, you know, how to uh, adequately um, maintain them. Um, so it's, it's going to, I think that's going to be uh, quite a, quite a, a lift. Um, so um, that's, that's my concerns, but I, I think it's, you know, last draw that, yeah, you, you entertain these type of things. Appreciate you, that Jim. comment and the experience, Jim, like wholeheartedly agree. Okay. I have, I have one, one more question. Is, is lead also included in this type of a, a survey or was, is that a separate issue for like line replacements? Um, it is a separate issue, although point of use and point of entry can be deployed. Um, so separate issue, but but definitely has some tie-in, I guess. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and one other thing, um, especially for homeowners, uh, I know in the coast here, there's a lot of old wells that are hand dug, um, some less than 20 feet deep. Would, would that type of a, a, a well be um, a candidate for just totally abandoning and not going through the point of entry, point of use type scenario, and um, you know, just go for uh, replacing with an adequate well uh, construction. Yeah, Jim, you get right to the heart of it. Like the kind of the 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 poor construction. If we're thinking about domestic wells, kind of the the less sophisticated this construction mm -hmm. is, the the more likely it is to have. A whole host of contaminants, including the bacteriological, which is like I tried to talk about quite quite a difficult task right now. And so, certainly in that scenario, um, yeah, leaning into finding another source or connecting to, you know, a, a nearby water system, like those are the solutions that we should be going for. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much for that, Jim. We we need to. Um, We'll move on to uh, the next folks who have raised their hand. We have five more raised hands and we'll start off with uh, Michael Prado. Michael, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, I'm getting to that. I'm a little slow. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Fisher. I knew I would see you again. <laughs> How are you? I'm well. I'm happy to see your friendly face. <laughs> Good to see you, friend. Yeah, um, the POE and the POU. Now, did you say the filters that they they put in is not going to catch everything? Um, the filters that you the the filters are specific to what you want to capture. So if you're trying to capture nitrate, you need a specific one. If you're trying to capture arsenic, you need a different specific one. So is there one that catches multiple? There is one that catch there are, there are some that catch it that catch multiple. Um, so you could put so sometimes the solution exists where if you have a couple contaminants you're concerned about, you can use a single device and it'll work. Okay. Now as long as Go ahead, Mr. Prado. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, like Jim said, you know, it goes back to this, as long as it's maintained well, it'll it'll continue to do what it, what it promises to do. Okay. Now, by putting the filters in, is that, that's not no long-term solution, right? That's like a Band-Aid? Yeah, I mean, I think of it as an interim solution um, hope, you know, the, the, the scenario that I like to think about is that there's a community that, you know, 
has a contamination issue and we can put in point of use or point of entry, um, you know, kind of right away until they can install, you know, centralized treatment or, or drill a new well or connect to their, to their neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. That's the scenario I like to think about. The, there is the other scenario that, that exists where there isn't another neighbor to connect to and the possibility of drilling, you know, a new source, compliant, a safe source mm -hmm. doesn't exist. And so we, we put it in as kind of an interim solution that we don't have a long-term solution to. So that's, it's a problem, you know? Yeah. Um, the other thing is by, by keep, uh, we keep buying these filters to put in the homes. That's going to, that's ending up being a waste of money, isn't it? You know, I, you know, for me, if it's, if it's providing that, safe, the safe, you know, if it's providing safe drinking water, absolutely not like a good, a, a great way for us to spend money, um, you know, and to op and whatever it cost, you know, if it costs to operate and maintain those to ensure that the safe drinking water is still provided, like absolutely a good, um, a good way to spend our money, um, you know, but it is an expense. And certainly I think maybe what you're getting at is, that you know it's a, it's an additional expense we're we're, we're going to spend that and hopefully we're going to spend on a centralized treatment plant or something like this so that's I, if i'm mischaracterizing that mr prado you tell me you hit it right on the nail you all, know, right. all right all right okay thank you thank okay, you so thank much you, mr finisher okay thank you. thanks so much for that so we've got uh five more folks five more hands that have been raised and um, if we can uh, limit our, our comments to no more than three minutes, that would be helpful. Uh, we do want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to participate. So um, next up is uh, Mario Lisa. Mario Lisa, if you can unmute yourself and provide your feedback. Está perfecto. Uh, como dije más antes, si se hace alcance comunitario, creo que esa sería una de las estrategias en llegar más directamente a la comunidad en el sentido en que las personas que somos parte de la comunidad, conocemos la comunidad y sería bueno si a esas personas se nos entrena en referente a lo que es más directamente lo del agua y enseñar al mismo tiempo a la comunidad para unirla, para educarla en el sentido en el qué clase de agua se está tomando. Si pueden usar filtros, si los filtros les cambia, si pueden usar agua de botella o como aquellos estén más informados, que el agua que están tomando sea realmente saludable, que la puedan tomar de uh, una uh, manguera como la tomo yo en mi casa, ¿verdad? Uh, para mí sería eso, el que se haga el alcance comunitario más cerquita, pero más con personas realmente que salgan de la comunidad. Para mí eso sería el unir a la comunidad. Lo demás no lo entiendo. Thank you for that. Um, Chad, did you have a response? Just that I 100% agree, 110% okay. agree. Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, we will now move on to uh, Sergio. Yeah, I, I would like to offer a, a little bit different perspective of of what is going on with the program we have here in the Eastern Coachella Valley regarding point of views. Um, goodness, uh, over 10 years ago, I realized that uh, the technology was available and the time that it would take to bring uh, domestic water uh, to those rural communities will take more than a decade. And I was not wrong. So ever since I started to work towards doing a pilot program and install, uh, to start installing point of views in the community. Mm -hmm. So I wanna just to say that today we have installed probably nearly 400 units uh, in those communities. And we have uh, one of the, the things that, that Chad uh, pointed mm -hmm. out really, really, really well is that the cornerstone of, of this is uh, building community trust. We have a really strong community relationship and we have somebody who go every day to check those things uh, at those uh, Polanco parks. So mm -hmm. it has become a really successful program. 
when it comes to maintenance, the kind of assistant that we use is super, super affordable. We only spend around $85 for the membrane, a five-stage membrane, and about $30 uh, uh, for a sediment filter. This is once a year, which is the most cost-effective approach. And that is the only maintenance that you can possibly think. There is no mechanical or, or pressure or devices. This system don't use any electricity and are definitely very easy to monitor. So, so once again, uh, for the kind of contamination we have, which is arsenic and fluoride, this has been definitely the, uh, the, the trademark here in the Eastern Coachella Valley. So I'm, I'm very happy to report that. So uh, when it comes to being the most cost-effective in terms of long-term solution, everything depends if there is a municipal service. I know that some community will never be able to get uh, consolidated to um, municipal service. In those particular cases, these uh, water filtration point of use and point of entry are here to stay for the long haul. Uh, so that's pretty much what I wanted to share. Thank you, Sergio. Thanks, Sergio. I also should say thank you again, Sergio, for participating in the report and providing a lot of like really fantastic insight and information. Just can't express that appreciation enough. Great. Okay, folks. My pleasure, Please. Chad. All right, we've got a few more folks. I wanna make sure we cover them all. So if we can please keep to at least three minutes or less, we could we can stay on time and, and, and make sure that we can wrap up in a decent hour, it's a Friday. Uh, okay, so Horacio, you're up next. I, I have some questions on mm -hmm. the point of use and point of entry first. Uh, what happens when you cannot clean up the water like TCP and nitrates? You can clean up uh, either TCP, but you cannot clean up nitrates. What happens there? Well, Rocio, I, th I think you're asking if there's, you know, if you have both of those contaminants at the, that you're dealing with there, you, the solution may be to, prov to install two different types of device devices, you know, one, in your in this example, one that cleans up the TCP and then another one that cleans up the nitrates, you'd have to have two. I'm not sure if I'm interpreting the question correctly. Yeah, the only thing is what happens when you have high levels of nitrate? Do you have uh, do you have uh, filters that they can clean it up? D depends on how it depends on how high the nitrates are. Um, you know, currently, if it's like I said, if it's above 25, you need something a little more special. And if it's above 40 ish, there there isn't something off the shelf. There are some technologies out there that that would work in that scenario. And that's one of the things that I hope that one of our pilots, that last pilot, POU and POE will address because there is technology mm -hmm. there. It's just not ready to go off the shelf right now. So we need to prove it out. So it is. So the other question, are the ones that are going to be able to use these devices, uh, is the Safer program going to pay for everything? Yeah, it, you know, there are, and somebody from DFA, if you want to jump in here, you know, we have our Division of Financial Assistance have, have funds available for counties to implement a program like this. And, you know, for, for folks that are disadvantaged, um, the the programs that are in place right now there isn't cost to the to the resident it, it is for it is free there so we need more of those types of we need more counties to participate um, so that it can happen everywhere but yeah so it will cover maintenance and all the devices yeah it the ones that we have out there right now cover the devices and the install and then um, I should know off the top of my head, but it is, it's not, it's not operations and maintenance forever. It's some of them I think are one year and some of them are three years. So that's a gap that we identified in the report. Because uh, the reason I ask is because there's a lot of uh, older people that can barely, uh, they cannot even get into under the sink or be checking out for the filters and their brains. Sometimes they don't work as uh, youngsters. 
So who's going to be taking care of those? Yep. Agree. Um, yeah, part of the part of the program needs to be this, then an ongoing operations and maintenance mm -hmm. structure for just what you're talking about. Because one of the one of the uh, we we had uh, high levels of nitrates and high levels of TCP, and they put a centralized system in 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 our system. It was about seventeen thousand dollars a month. So what happens there? Who's going to cover for those big uh, expenses when you have to put a centralized system? Yeah, is yeah. there, is there, can we get, uh, Megan, could you maybe chime in? Or anybody? I, I'm anything? sorry, can you repeat that question? Thanks. Yeah, when you have high levels of TCP and high levels of nitrates, they require a centralized, um, uh, system to clean up both of them and the cost for 96, uh, 80, 96 connections was $17,500. Is Who's going to cover all those expenses? Yeah, I mean, really, we um, we need to look at individual cases like that case by case, you know, we do have sort of most of our funding for construction projects is set up with per connection limits and a project of that magnitude would probably exceed those. And so generally in those cases, we have to take a look at whether we want to make a recommendation recommendation to our board to, you know, approve a project that exceeds our normal thresholds. So it's, it's kind of a case by case decision based on what other alternatives are out there. And yeah. if there aren't any, you know, what other funding sources might be able to co cobble together or whatnot. Yeah, the reason I'm telling you this is because we went through all this with point of use and point of entry. And the only solution was to find uh, long term solutions. And the only way it was is by bringing water two miles away because that was the only way of getting clean water. All right. Thank you, Horacio. We need to move on to the yes. other two questions. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We're running a little bit behind. So if we can have um, Michael Rincon, uh, followed by Sandra and Isabel, if we can just uh, keep it to at least no more than three minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I, I wrote myself down, so it'll be quicker. Definitely. <laughs> um, uh, so the first question I have, uh, or comment, I guess, is that um, I fully support that CBO should be at the center of the outreach strategy. I think they have more trust and credibility with the community residents. And in some cases, unfortunately, uh, community water customers tend to not trust their uh, water purveyor. No offense to the folks in this group. Um, so I definitely would highlight the importance of uh, engaging with CBOs for sure. Um, and then second, um, I guess my question, it was kind of partially answered earlier that this is more of an interim solution. But I guess my goal is even with an interim solution, like what metrics are you considering to deem this interim solution to be a success is it like to get folks to depend less on like bottled water dependency when there's like a, a water quality issue or a water shortage um and then therefore reduce costs or is it to put less stress on the water purveyors by slightly delaying key investments needed and then the last question i have is <clears throat> well are these projects meant to be just either P, uh, POU or POE, or will some projects sites like include both? I'll jump in on a couple of those. The last question about point of use and point of entry, is it kind of just, you know, is it one or the other or both? It can be one or the other or both, depending on what type of contaminants and how many contaminants um, the, the specific site, you know, experiences. So, um, and then the second question, um, I think the question there was, um, 
you know, what kind of defines interim solution? Am I categorizing that okay, Michael? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, um, I'll answer. And then if you want to tell me where I messed up, tell me. Um, I th you know, we think about them as far as in as interim, um, because because if a if a more robust solution, if there is a consolidation potential or a new source or centralized treatment, if that is available, you know, the, that those infrastructure projects take a while to to construct and to implement, right? And so, if we can install or if we can deploy point of use and point of entry in that interim period from you know today until that infrastructure is built, then you know that reduces exposure and is 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 a plus for the community. Um, I'm not sure if that answers. And so that when I think when when I hear interim or when I think interim, that's what I think like as a as an in between until a more robust larger infrastructure project happens. Thanks okay. so much, Chad. Yeah, that answers my question. Right. Okay. All right. So um, next up is Sandra. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so for nitrates, um, let's say we're using a filter that focuses on primarily reducing exposure to nitrates. Um, because uh, management zones are responsible for nitrate remediation, um, would these funds for the, these filters be coming out of management zones? And then my other question also is, um, so let's say for nitrate specifically or, or any, any contaminant, um, let's say when the point of use or point of entry is installed, the MCL um, isn't high, isn't too high to where the filter could still help. How are we going to prevent or just keep checking on it so that maybe if later there is more exposure to said well or more um, like a higher contaminant level than shows up later, how are we going to prevent that or just make sure that we're checking on that? So I'm thinking who who is installing this and who's going to keep um, eyes on that, on the POU and POE? Yeah, I'll answer the last question and then maybe somebody from DFA can talk about the management zone and DFA funding interaction. Um, so Sandra, if we're taught, if we're, you know, you strike right to the heart, which is the operations and maintenance, like once it's installed correctly, um, you know, who and how is it properly operated and maintained to ensure just what you're talking about, that if the if contamination, you know, either stays the same or increases, that it's still being, a, that the device is still effective in providing safe water, right? And so um, in a public water system paradigm, the public water system has, you know, a whole regulatory framework, which, in, which ensures that that happens. In a domestic well paradigm, like I tried to talk about, that, par that, that regulatory structure doesn't exist. And so one of the kind of conclusions of the report is that that is that there needs to be kind of a, some sort of overarching, um, some sort of overarching entity that could do the operations and maintenance and ensure that that happens, right? Because it's not backstopped in the regulation. So yeah, you're right. Anyway, I 100% like that's the, that's the thing. So. Thank you so much for that, Chad. Sandra, for your question. Okay, so we're going to move on to our last commenter, Isabel. Isabel, can you please unmute yourself and provide your feedback? Sí, sería, soy, voy a ser muy breve. Um, es como punto de uso y de entrada, sería una solución que llegaría para quedarse. Esa es una pregunta. ¿Quién pagaría por dichos mantenimientos? Creo que me han estado contestando en esto. Y después que se, um, de esto, digamos que se tiene que perforar más profundo uh, porque los pozos se siguen secando uh, y, y encontramos más contaminantes. ¿De ahí qué? Eh, ¿A dónde vamos?
So the, um, yeah, we kind of talked about the operations and maintenance, like you said, for, um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, um, for, you know, who pays for the operations and maintenance. Um, you know, right now, if it's in a public water system paradigm, it's essentially the rate payers that are, that are paying that. The residents are paying through the, for that through their, through their water rates. If we're in a domestic well scenario, um, there is some initial support for the installation and some initial um, operation and maintenance. But after that, that's that responsibility shifting on to the, shifting on to the resident. Um, to ensure that that goes on. And then it goes back to just what Michael was touching on is like, can there be, you know, is there or can there be a kind of an overarching, you know, responsible agency to carry that on? Um, and then the question, you know, it strikes me about, you know, what Michael said also is just if there, you know, how do we account for changing water, you know, water scenarios, water uh, changing contaminant profiles, and again, falls back to a robust operations and maintenance program. Great. All right, folks, thanks so much, Chad. And oh my God, thank you so much for all these wonderful, the wonderful feedback. Really great and interesting discussion. Okay, with that, we're going to Excuse transition. Me? Excuse me? We're going okay. to transition to the next portion. Did you want to make one quick comment? Because we were running yeah, behind. I, I just... Yeah. I just wanted to mention that my first sure. question wasn't answered oh. about the management zones. Sandra, I just covered it in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, so oh, thank you. Work. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for bringing that up, Sandra. Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so now uh, we're going to go ahead and transition it over to Haiti. Thanks, Marina. Yeah, sure. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to provide a high level summary of a couple of items on the SAFO program updates. You can follow along on page eight and nine. Um, well, starting on page eight, I'm gonna say, uh, in your meeting packet. Uh, questions and comments will be taken at the end of the updates. Next slide. The report from the state auditor suggested that the state water board lacks urgency in delivering needed assistance, citing long process times, and the state auditor included a number, a number of recommendations to improve processes and procedures. The state water board disagrees with the reports, framing that the board lacks urgency in providing assistance to communities and agrees to continue to build upon a opportunities to improve how it delivers assistance to communities most in need. The Safer Drinking Water Program has moved as quickly as possible to assist more systems and communities with managing complex drinking water challenges brought on by drought, contamination, aging infrastructure, and legacies of redlining and racial inequity. Our accomplishments in just the first three years of a 10-year program speak to the urgency with which we have advanced the human right to water as one of the board's top priorities. Our highest priority is advancing the human right to water. While the need has far out space, the capacity to hire new staff resulted in longer processing times in some cases. Ultimately, the board has delivered more assistance to communities than ever before. We have and will continue to work with communities impacted by lack of water, as well as local agencies, stakeholders, and technical assistance providers to help accelerate our processes and develop innovative approaches to ensuring communities can get the financial assistance needed to have safe drinking water. We embrace all all improvements that can help build on the achieve, achievements of the Safe Drinking Water Program to bring safe, clean, and affordable water to all Californians as quickly as possible. There are a few bills that passed uh, that are now sitting at the governor's desk to sign. SB 222 will create, um, and you can also follow along on page for, for the drinking water legislation, you can follow along on page 12. SB 222 
will create a first in the nation statewide water rate assistance program. For years, California families have faced the reality of having their water shut off due to inability to pay their bills, their water bills. Now they can rest easier knowing that they have access to permanent monthly support for water affordability. AB 2108 will ensure racial equity is front and center in the planning process for major permits and decisions at the state and regional water boards, while also reducing barriers for environmental justice and tribes to participate in public decision making. And AB 2877 will require limited waivers of sovereign immunity for safer projects to be narrowly drafted and requires tribal liaison to participate in every meeting Division of Financial Assistance has with a tribe. For more information, you can go to uh, your meeting packet for legislation updates related to the safer program. Next slide. To round up our SAFER timeline, our last SAFER advisory group meeting for the year is scheduled for December 1. And as mentioned this morning, the meeting will be held virtually. We will provide more information once it becomes available. The SAFER advisory group application period will end on September 23rd. There, there are 11 seats open for the 2023-24 advisory group, um, SAFER advisory group. Applicants will be selected and notified by winter 2022. The State Water Board will host a virtual informational se session to answer questions and provide information on September 15. Also this month, an affordability workshop will be held on September 20th, as well as next quarter. You can find more information about upcoming workshops on how to register on page 10 and 11 of your meeting packet. And next quarter, starting in October, um, be on the lookout for the POU POE workshops that uh, Chad just uh, presented on, uh, the release of the POU POE report. And uh, we've updated the date for when the board will consider adoption of the financial, the funding expenditure plan, the FEP, on October 3rd. In December, a board meeting will be held on the administrator handbook and administrator, sorry, and advisory group members of 2023, 24 will be selected. Before we take any questions, I would like to turn to our water board staff if you would like to add uh, to any of the updates. Okay. So I, at this time, um, if we can go ahead and um, advance the slide and I'll hand it over to Marina. Whoops, thanks, Haiti. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> All right, folks, so um, we have approximately five minutes or so to take questions. So if anybody has questions, please use the raised hand feature and uh, we'll, we'll call your name. Okay, we have uh, Horacio and Mario Lisa. Horacio, would you wanna go first, please? Yeah, I have a question. How many terms does an advisory committee, uh, you know, an advisory guy can, uh, can apply? Great question, Horacio. We will uh, get back to you on that. I don't have that answer in front of me, but I, I will make sure that we do uh, get back to you with an answer. Okay, because uh, this is my second term and I think I'm up uh, and I'd like to know if I can apply again or not. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay, um, next up is Maria Lisa. Yo nada más quiero decirle que gracias por la buena noticia que dio de que se pasaron los biles. Ah, fui una de las que fui en el grupo a abogar para que se pasaran los biles, puesto que soy comunidad 
y el agua está muy cara y en muchos lugares no nomás está cara, está contaminada y aún así se pagan dos cosas porque se tiene que comprar agua de botella para sobrevivir y se tiene que pagar el bill de la cuenta del bill que nos trae el agua a la casa. Aunque me han dicho que el agua es absolutamente gratis, únicamente yo pago el servicio. Esa es una gran pregunta que ahí la dejo porque fue la respuesta que me dio una persona experta en leyes del agua. Y por eso me quedo con eso como que, ¿por qué se dice que el agua es gratis si a mí me cobran por porque el agua llega a mi casa? Pero muchísimas gracias por la, por la buena noticia. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, looks like there aren't any more questions. And so uh, at this point, I'm going to just do a quick reminder for folks or for those of you that have not yet reapplied uh, for another term for as advisory group members, please know that you do need to reapply uh, and that the application deadline is on September 23rd. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call a break. So it is 3.45. We will please return by 3.50, 3.50. So we will see you back in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, folks, we're welcome back from your brief break. It's 3.50 p.m. We're going to uh, start with our last portion of the meeting, um, which are the advisory group member announcements. But um, before we move forward with that, Heidi, did you want to make some a few comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Marina. Um, and welcome, folks. Welcome. Welcome back from the break. Um, I know it was a short break, but um, it's helpful just to step away from your computer. But I, I do want to circle back that the bills that I mentioned earlier, they haven't completely passed. They are sitting in the governor's desk to get that signed off. So once the governor signs it off, that means it has passed completely. So it meaning that once it gets to his desk, that it's almost there, but at any time the governor can also deny it. So I just wanted to mention that um, it hasn't completely passed, but th these are some of the highlights of the bills that uh, we are looking forward to and hoping that it will pass. Thank you for that clarification, Haiti. Okay, uh -huh. all right. So, uh, we forgot to move the slide to break. So we're gonna skip over from questions to break to uh, advisory group member announcements. All right, uh, next slide. Well, slide after that. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. We will now transition into advisory group members announcement. Uh, we will now ask advisory group members to share in three minutes or less in the interest of time. Um, to share what they are doing, what they're working on, uh, taking up under drinking water projects with the SAFER program. Next slide. Okay. And so within three minutes, if possible, um, if you can provide the project title um, of the of what you're working on, or even an event that you just attended, uh, the project timeline, event, time, the purpose, the intended outcomes, um, and any resources that you have based on the information that you're providing so that we can share that with the entire group. So um, we'll take our, we'll take some hands, some raised hands if you have any updates that you'd like to share. We have one hand. Okay, Ethel, go ahead. Um, I just want to share that uh, I'm working for our community. Uh, we just submit, completed an, app, uh, an, an application for a um, engineering plan and design for our community to have uh, safer water. And uh, we just completed the submission a week ago um and hopefully we will hear back for what the next step would be we already have chosen an engineer and we submitted the scope of work so that's our that's my project ongoing at the moment great thank you um that's great to hear progress so Eth ethel could you could you stay i'm sorry could you provide the name of your community um it's uh, lake francis lake mutual francis. water um, uh, Lake Francis Mutual Water Company. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another hand, uh, Horacio, followed by Isabel. Um, Go ahead, Horacio. Yes, uh, so um, we are still working on a transfer of the water system from the county to the community of San Gerardo. We asked for the transfer back in 2016 and the county came back and said uh, they, they want to transfer it to the community. So we asked the state water board for help on technical assistance and the board approved giving us um, technical assistance provider. So I want to thank the, the the staff at the State Water Board for providing this technical assistance to the community of San Gerardo. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Horacio. Okay, uh, we'll move on to Isabel. 
¿Sabe? Bueno, aquí en la comunidad de Lener estamos trabajando en posible conexión, en anexión con un sistema más grande. Eh, hemos pedido ayuda a la mesa estatal del agua, eh, a conexión el agua que tenemos de nuestro pozo y, y posible también trabajar con lo, las aguas negras que tenemos un problema súper serio en el drenaje. No tenemos drenaje y son pozos sépticos que están en súper malas condiciones y a la par eso nos causa problemas a que tengamos nitratos. So, ese es el objetivo que tenemos y vamos avanzando. Esperemos que se logre. Gracias. Thank you for, thank you for the announcement. I believe Jennifer was up next. Jennifer, did you still want to make a, an announcement? Yes, I, I just wanted to say I don't have a specific project title, mm -hmm. but currently at RCAC, our, our technical assistance providers are working with 48 different communities right now to assist them with their um, technical needs. And most of those projects are, are full planning projects. And I just wanted to say how much we appreciate our partnership um, with the Division of Drinking Water and especially our project manager um, at DFA. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing that. Okay, um, our next uh, advisory group member announcement will come from Cassie. Cassie, do you wanna share your announcement? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Marina. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things from the GSA perspective. Um, one is we are now doing um, Sigma implementation projects and one that was just completed in the North Kings Groundwater Sustainability Agency is the Savory, Savory Groundwater Recharge Basin. We changed the name, so I was trying to make sure I got that right. <laughs> And I bring that up simply because I think Sigma has provided an opportunity for us to think differently about strategic placement of basins. And this particular basin is located very close to a severely disadvantaged community, the Shady Lakes Manufactured Home Community. And we've worked very closely with um, CRLA, CRLA and the community members on that project. So I think it's really an example of maybe not a traditional solution, um, but something nonetheless that will provide a benefit to that community as well as domestic well owners in the area. And then I also wanted to mention, um, and I mentioned this earlier in some of my comments, just the collaboration piece. That's another just really good example when you get all of those collective folks in the room and can really think about, you know, the best solution for the community, for the irrigation district and the GSA. That's, that's an example of how we can um, leverage all of those resources and come out with really good solutions. The other thing I was just going to mention is um, the groundwater sustainability plans were just resubmitted to the state for most of the critically overdrafted basins that had deficiencies. And so we've been really busy trying to address the deficiencies. And most of those resubmitted plans included uh, some type of a domestic well or a shallow well mitigation program. So again, I, I think um, to the extent possible where we can leverage all, everyone who is collectively working on solving domestic well issues or solving nitrate contamination issues, um, as someone mentioned earlier about the management zones, the, the further we can stretch the dollars and the more solutions that can get implemented. So that's just a brief update on some of the things happening in this neck of the woods. Thank you. Thanks, Cassie. Okay, so it looks like we have just one more announcement from Sergio before we can move on to public comment. So Sergio, would you like to share your announcement. Yes, just want to just to announce to everyone that uh, we're very appreciative of the support that we have for the State Water Boards. We just uh, complete the grant uh, agreement uh, uh, for our program, interim drinking water program, um, so that we can continue um, installing more point of views while water consolidation, uh, it takes place in the Eastern Coachella Valley. Um, with, with, with this program, we will be probably close to 85% of the population being actually covered by point of views. And the majority of these 
are in the path of consolidation. So this is a definitely good example of how mm -hmm. a point of view is going to be extremely instrumental to be a gap uh, of, for the time that, that we are just the planning and design. Uh, we're hoping also uh, to complete all the engineering, uh, planning and design, CEQAS, uh, towards the end of, of this year for the two biggest projects in the Eastern Coachella Valley that will actually be water consolidation and addressing the highest uh, uh, levels of arsenic and fluoride in the Eastern Coachella Valley. So that's definitely, we're very happy to report that. That's exciting news, Sophia. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So we, we're running pretty tight on time. However, we see that there are, there were, there were two hands up and we want to make sure folks are able to share their announcements. So Michael Prado, uh, would you like to, uh, share your announcement? Yes. I just want to let everybody know that our consolidation project that we have going on on our fifth year getting it consolidated with the community of Munson, which is three miles south of Sultana, California. And they came out there to bid for the well drilling last week and the pipeline interconnection, they're out. Their bid is due by the 15th of September. So we're very happy and thankful that we have a good uh, state water board and uh, definitely the financial department. And thank you all that one of these days is going to be reality. And also the property deed is in uh, review right now with our attorney. And we will be owning the piece of property where the land uh, well is going to go on. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. OK. Looks like we uh, completed our announcements. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, at this point, we're going to uh, move ahead um, to the next portion. Oh, sorry, it looks like Jim had a comment. Sorry, apologies, Jim. Do you wanna make your comment before we move on to public comment? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you, so you lowered your hand, so I missed you. I did, I did. I was <laughs> yeah. in the- Go for it. This is real quick. I just wanted to thank the Safer folks. Um, they're um, helping Mendocino County and specifically uh, the coastal area of Mendocino uh, for an engagement uh, uh, opportunity in October uh, to uh, talk about uh, possibility of uh, creating a, a community water system out in this part of the coast. Um, and also for assisting in discussions uh, to uh, try to get uh, some of the funding opportunities for the countywide and regional uh, funding programs. Uh, just appreciate their help. Thanks. Great. Thank you for that, Jim. Okay, so thank you folks for sharing your updates. Um, our staff has noted your updates um, in our in the meeting notes, and we'll make sure to provide it for your review in the next few weeks. Uh, we'll now move on to the last portion of the meeting and um, I'll lead us into the public comment section. Uh, so if we can move on to uh, next slide, please. Great. Okay. So um, we now open the meeting uh, for public comments and public comments can uh, be submitted uh, via email to safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Uh, you can also follow the instructions in the return email to join Zoom. Uh, you should be wait. You should wait to be called on, and you will have at least three minutes to speak. Uh, for assistance, for technical or language assistance, email safer at waterboards.ca.gov. And uh, okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking uh, comments that we've received. Um, a second, uh, submitted via Zoom. So do we have any Zoom comments that we received? Marina, we do yep. have um, a, a public commenter in the waiting room. So whenever you are ready, okay. admit him. Very good. Let's go ahead and do that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Okay. So we have admitted uh, our first public commenter, Eric Ore Orellana. Welcome, Eric. Do 
we cannot hear you. I'm not sure if you're, if you're muted. Thanks, Marina. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Coriano. I'm a policy advocate with Community Water Center. I uh, really appreciate the discussion that's uh, been going on so far today. Uh, and I just wanted to make a couple of observations uh, in regards to the strategy for state small water systems and private domestic wells. Uh, I think a lot of the themes that I heard from community partners today was uh, a sense to, to see more collaboration between the counties on local level, as well as uh, the entities that are working to uh, manage the groundwater basins uh, through Sigma, as well as manage uh, the salinity of, of groundwater basins as well through the CV Salts Management Zone programs. Um, I wanted to first uh, note on the counties, uh, I think that uh, something that we've heard today is that uh, there needs to be really, I, I know, I think what I heard today is that there's an appetite for collaboration from the State Water Board uh, and some counties as well. But I think really we might, uh, or the board might need to uh, push for uh, stricter uh, mandates and oversight of counties to really come to the table uh, and try to uh, address the challenges that we're seeing on a local level, particularly to uh, private domestic wells and state small water systems. Um, for uh, management zones and uh, groundwater sustainability agencies, uh, I think their the management zones are a little bit more ahead in terms of implementing uh, what we could consider mitigation programs. Um, and so I think it's really important to make sure that uh, one, uh, we're pushing the management zones to do the outreach that they're required to uh, and to help us uh, reach those community members who have uh, domestic wells and are at risk of drought or water quality issue. Uh, but we also need to uh, really help and push the GSAs uh, to get to a point where uh, they can develop and implement these programs already with many impacts through the drought. Uh, this year and last year, uh, and really a plan uh, or just some wording within GSPs is not sufficient enough. We need to see those plans be more robust and, and being sort of more further along and reaching out to residents who are being impacted uh, by the management of those entities. Um, another uh, just comment that I wanted to make is uh, we really need to see more uh, being done to address private domestic laws. And so Community Water Center really supports uh, a, an effort from the state to implement a statewide uh, well testing and outreach effort. Uh, right now, I would say, um, just looking at the tables that, that were presented earlier today, I would say being nice, the state has probably reached out to about 5,000 households uh, through its current efforts in well testing and uh, um, providing solutions. And we have more than 90,000 at risk. And so really, we're just barely uh, skimming the surface in terms of the outreach that's necessary. Uh, and so I think we really need to think about, you know, what we can require from counties, uh, what we can require from entities who are making the problem worse, and uh, really what role the State Water Board has in pushing for uh, solutions at the legislature to make that happen. Uh, and so uh, yeah, I just really want to encourage you all. I know we're doing a lot of hard work to uh, outreach to folks, um, but really uh, we've got a long way to go and, and, and we really need to be more ambitious, uh, think uh, more outside the box in terms of how we can do the outreach. Uh, I know that um, many households throughout the state uh, are really in need of uh, more support and more resources uh, related to their drinking water. So uh, those were a couple of comments that uh, I wanted to make around the strategies for uh, private domestic wells and state small water systems. I'm uh, really excited to also see the State Water Board uh, having be, uh, begun providing direct O&M assistance to uh, communities and water systems struggling to meet uh, the needs of, of, of their communities. And so really I'm looking forward to seeing more of that uh, as uh, the State Water Board develops further guidance on O&M direct assistance. Uh, and yeah, just really looking forward to uh, the State Water Board, uh, leveraging more administrators, more technical assistance providers, but still prioritizing the uh, education and outreach really necessary to build trust with community members, uh, to consult them on mm -hmm. what is the best uh, decision for uh, their drinking water needs. So I'll stop there and, and we'll, we'll submit a comment letter 
in response to the safer fund expenditure plan uh, with uh, further details on in, in respect to our comments, but really appreciate the work of everyone today and the time of every community partner uh, in participating in the Safer Advisor Group today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Eric. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so folks, we're gonna, we, we will move on to um, comments that we received via email. And I'm just gonna read them one by one. Um, the first one is from, and I, forgive me if I'm mis mispronouncing some of these names, uh, Stephen St. Marie from California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, the comment is, what is the bill number for the new administrator liability protection? So uh, comment number two from Bruce, um, Sorry, uh, Hodeschelt, uh, uh, last name spelled H-O-U-D-E-S-S-H-E-L-D-T from the Northern California Water Association. Apologies if I, I mispronounced your name. Uh, the comment is regarding the nitrate chart, what time period it, do the results represent? The municipal wells for yellow seemed like it represented a time period before the Woodland Davis Clean Water Project came online. Uh, Another comment from, from Bruce uh, is, are you coordinating the development of your outreach plan with the work being done by the management zones? There are lessons from previous outreach efforts with self-help enterprises and um, women, infant and children WIC to test wells and provide resources. So those are the three comments, public comments we receive via email. Um, Jeff or Haiti, let me know if there's any more that um, we need to read. I think we got them all, Marina. Okay. Very thank good. I wanna thank everybody for providing the comments. And again, uh, thank you for your time. I know it's been a long day, but do, we really do appreciate the comments and feedbacks that you have. Okay. All right, so uh, moving on to uh, the next uh portion of the meeting. Um, and that's basically, we're almost at the end of our time together today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we'd like to, before we uh, end the meeting today, I'd like to share a few next steps. First, we will launch a poll uh, to ask, I think, can you go, sorry, go back one slide. We're going to launch a poll, apologies on that. We're, we're gonna launch a poll to ask for your feedback on today's meeting. Uh, two, we're gonna take a quick break. And then three, we're gonna return from the break to have our closed session on the conflict of interest. Uh, please do not log off, please stay on. It's important that you stay on. Okay, so with that, uh, Kristen, uh, can you please launch uh, the first poll question? So please note that um, there's more than one uh, um, response to a question. So uh, feel free. Hey, it looks like the majority of folks have responded and it looks like uh, uh, most of the folks, 46% are very satisfied and satisfied, which is great. Thank you for your feedback. All right, let's move on to uh, the second uh, poll question, Kristen. All right, folks, so the, the second question is up. Can you um, please provide your input? Okay, looks like everybody submitted responses and uh, looks like a lot of folks uh, said that they understood the topics that were discussed at 92%. Uh, 
100% said they were comfortable participating in the meeting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another a big chunk, 87% said it was a good use of her time. And 87% uh, said that the meeting shared useful information. And 67% indicated that the meeting materials were easy to read and understand. Thank you for that, that feedback. Okay. All right, so question three is being launched. So if you can please look at that and provide your input. All right. Okay, it looks like everybody's answered now. All right. So about 44% of you thought the meeting went well. Uh, uh, about 13% of you uh, indicated that we can make some improvements on the presentations. Another 19% indicated that uh, the meeting logistics and Zoom issues could be improved. Uh, only 6% said that um, communication before the meeting could be improved. And uh, the agenda, 13% of you thought the agenda and the flow of the meeting could also be improved. And 19% of you indicated meeting materials. Um, needed to be improved. So very helpful information. Thank you. All right. And the last, I guess this is the last question, question four. Is question four is up and uh, feel free to right away, write anything that you'd like to share uh, with the state water board staff.
All right, looks like uh, we received all of your comments and your feedback. So we really do appreciate uh, you sticking around to, to take this poll. So uh, what we're gonna do next folks is um, we are going to, um, first of all, thank you Kristen for launching that poll and for, for guiding us to this effort. Uh, and thanks so much for your participation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at this point, uh, we are going to um, in the recording and thank everybody for your time and dedication. However, I wanna make sure you do not log off. We still have the conflict of interest training. So uh, again, thank you all for, for everybody who provided the comments. We wanna especially thank the State Water Board Safer team for organizing the meeting. And again, before we end this meeting and stop recording for the, record, for the closed session, I'd like to remind advisory group members to remain logged in for the conflict of interest training. This will be a closed session and members of the public will not be allowed to participate. The closed session will not be recorded. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so um, we're gonna take a quick five minute break. So if you can come back at uh, 427, that would be helpful. And then we'll just go straight into the closed session. Please make sure to return. Uh, this is a quick training, but it's, a, it's an important one. So we will see you back at 427. <laughs>